Um, and so today we're going to be dealing with four different areas of research, um, education, um, economic opportunity, criminal justice and health, and more specifically, uh, uh, mental health issues. And this is part of the initiative that came out of the central search uh, process. So the, the research and public policy initiative uh, was something that came out of the search process in a, as a way of trying to uh, promote more research on Puerto Ricans. And as you will see from today's conference, uh, it is just incredibly important for us to be focusing on the Puerto Rican community because we've sort of been lost in the process of the research being done about Latinos and Hispanics and we have, we have been losing what is actually happening in Puerto Rican community. Um, before I uh, present uh, the two presenters right now, I just want to thank a few people. Uh, certainly the director of Centro, Edwin Melendez, who has helped uh, so much in trying to provide leadership and vision, uh, trying to deal with some of these uh, very uh, important issues in the Puerto Rican community. Um, and, for, and I want to thank him also for, for bringing me on as part of this process to direct uh, this, this particular initiative. Um, many staff members have, have taken part uh, from the Centro in the process of putting um, this event together and in the process of, of helping out with research. Uh, Iris Abad Martinez and Visser Lucas Pedraza. Um, some of the staff, the support staff as well, Jose de Jesus, Janice Pineda, um, Rosalie uh, Romero, and the Centro staff that have all come together to help uh, put this event together. So I want to give them a special thank you. Um, on your program, as you see, there are also two rooms that will be used uh, as part of this conference on the third floor, uh, 313, 316. Um, in 316, you'll have the uh, criminal justice um, panel. Uh, 313, you'll have the economic opportunities panel. Uh, they're just for below here. You can just take the stairway here or the elevator. Um, the uh, other panels will, will be uh, in this room. Um, uh, the uh, health panel will be here and the edu education panel will be in the cafeteria. Um, they're, they're setting up, so once we're done here, that should be ready to go. Uh, so without any more delay, I just want to uh, introduce our, our first two uh, speakers. First, our, our keynote speaker, uh, Juan Cartagena, who's general counsel and vice president uh, for advocacy at the Community Service Society. Uh, he's been with the Community, Society, Community Service Society as part of its senior management team since 1991. Um, he has been advancing an, an, an important agenda at Community Ser Service Society through litigation um, and legal intervention strategies uh, for a num quite a number of years now. Um, he's a dear friend, somebody who has been uh, deeply committed to uh, issues of, of uh, the advancement of the Puerto Rican community and the rights of the Puerto Rican community. We go back um, to our days at the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, so it's really indeed a pleasure uh, to introduce to you uh, Juan Cartagena. Buen dia. Buen dia. I hope you can hear me back there. Chévere. Let me not last if I'm not sure what's happening. Um, I actually, um, I'm very happy that I had an opportunity to have the opportunity here to talk to you about a report that is the basis of my presentation to you. And then I want to talk about the reaction to the report, which is, to me, in many ways, equally as fascinating as the actual report numbers themselves. I, um, I work with Lazar Tresham. He works, he's the Director of Youth Policy at CSS. And I get to supervise his work along with the work of our housing policy analysts, of our labor market analysts, and the work of, uh, that I do a lot with my lawyers on policies regarding mass imprisonment and re-entry. So those are the four basic areas that now supervise the CSS. Um, and the last area of, of significant work by CSS in the policy area is health related. And we have a wonderful person leading up that charge, both on the direct service side, training side, and health policy side. And her name is Elizabeth Benjamin. About a year ago, we were here, I think, together um, at one of these sessions that Edwin put together. And David Jones, who I work with, uh, was able to present some uh, thoughts about kind of issues uh, confronting uh, the New York City uh, poverty populations in the city of New York. As you know, that's what CSS basically focuses on. But I had a very, very interesting um, set of weeks since October 29th when this report 
was uh, highlighted in a New York Times article in which the report, which in fact says that Latino youth across the board are basically in a crisis, uh, ages 16 to 24, by the way, only 16 to 24. Um, because particularly there, what we what we we'll call the disconnected rate, the disconnection from either the labor market or from schooling, uh, was very, very, very high. Uh, the Times took that and titled it "Puerto Rican Youth Disadvantaged Most," and it became a very, very interesting dynamic for for my organization, as you can imagine, for me, como Puerto, Puerto Rican, and um, and for the research itself. Um, El Diario de la Prensa ran a front page lead to the story and then ran a, an excellent coverage of the issues in the report and how they affect uh, Latinos in general and the three subgroups that are the largest ones that we focused on because of their numbers, uh, Dominicans, Puerto Ricanos, and Mexicans. So uh, since the 29th of October, I have uh, done this presentation several times. So if I should change it, it's because I've been doing it quite a bit. Anoche lo hice. Uh, in front of 300, 300 congregants of the primitive church in the Lower East Side, Puerto Rican church in the Lower East Side, and 300 people came out last night in the cold just to hear about this report. Um, so it's really getting a lot of traction. Um, if we don't mind going to the next couple, uh, the next slide as well. Uh, the methodology is reported pretty, pretty straightforward. It is American Community Survey data for three years, blended. Uh, 2006, 2007, 2008. Those of you who work with this data set know that one year alone is not enough to give you reliable indicators. Uh, Lazar uh, used three years of data and uh, was able to focus on New York City directly. We, the next one, please. Uh, and this work actually builds off quite a bit of work at CSF that we've done some close, close time. And I actually want to start talking about some of that previous work because it really sets the context for what we're talking about here. Um, in 2005, CSS issued a report called Out of School, Out of Work, Out of Luck. And Mark Levitan was the primary author of that report. And in that particular report, Mark uh, concluded that uh, New York City is very unique, that uh, youth between 16 and 24 uh, were having very major challenges in being connected primarily though to the labor market because when you compare the youth in New York City to the youth throughout the country they were actually very similar in engagement to and attachment to schooling programs but the labor market was not able to absorb them and therefore leading into a very high rate of disconnection and again disconnection is completely the, the phenomenon of not being involved in school and not being attached to the living market. Now, by the way, that does not mean the official unemployment figures. Because as you know, there's a difference between the two. We talk about individuals who literally just stop looking for work because there is no work to be found. Out of school, out of work, of disconnected youth data. What he found was very, very interesting because we, at CSS, we took his database and we combined it with another other reports that were talking about black male joblessness, primarily black males in New York City. And the combination of those two reports led to this phenomenon in my, in my CSS, in which we were really promoting this whole idea about how to jumpstart a conversation on policy and to deal with black male unemployment and black male joblessness. But lo que pasa with that analysis is that it doesn't really account for the fact that Mark in 2005 actually documented that the disconnected rate for Latino was higher than blacks. So Latino population, 16 to 24, were actually out of the job market and out of schooling at rates even higher than young black men or women, for that matter. Um, and that report, he again was able to document that it was really a feature of how the labor market in New York City, particularly New York City, of course, was in New York City data, did not, uh, was not able to absorb uh, young people as they were able to try to get a job. Then we talk about what is this, what's, I've done this, this presentation that people would ask me, what is so magical about the period between 16 and 24? Well, it happens to coincide with a lot of other reports about disconnected youth in general, both national reports and localized regional reports. So the age of 16 is very, very important because that's the age where adolescence starts to blend into adulthood. Decisions about whether you stay in school or not are made much more differently at age 16 than the age of 14 or 13, obviously. 
In New York State, and we could probably talk about this in the criminal justice panel, but New York State is the only state in the country that criminalizes behavior at the age of 16. It criminalizes behavior at the young age of 16. You can be treated as an adult for criminal justice purposes. And what's so magical about the end date, the 24? Well, a lot of the research that Lazar and Mark have already cited and used, uh, some of the research by, um, I think it's Beshevoff and some by uh, Sums, uh, indicates that if you have not established a positive work experience before your age of 25, you're very likely, the odds against you of establishing a positive work experience for the rest of your adult life is very, very, very low. Now some of this research builds on what's called path-dependent research. That your earnings and employment possibilities depend on how much earnings you've had in your media past and your employment trajectory. In other words, that large gaps in your resume make it very unlikely for you to be able to earn at rates commensurate with both your age and experience. So in many ways, if you haven't gotten it together in the labor market by the age of 25, the odds against you are very, very, very high. So we've been looking at this age group for, for a reason. And lastly, uh, I'll just jump to the Basic Skills Better Futures report, was a report that Lazar co-wrote at CSS, in which we documented that the GED passage rate in New York City, actually, excuse me, the GED passage rate in New York State is the worst in the country. We are 50th out of 50. Think of a state in this country in which you can imagine or contemplate a stereotype their education system, their people, their income, their deficits, whatever they might be in your head, we are worse. Um, and that particular report from Better Skills, uh, Basic Skills of Better Futures was able to try to document what needs to happen in terms of testing, site preparation, and preparation for GED in general. We can, if we don't mind, we can go to the next one, Gracia. So, let's Let's start with the first slides, a couple of slides. I have to do this pretty fast because I know we're running for time. White people in the city of New York are definitely the majority group for all purposes, but that becomes a phenomenon of age. Um, and the report is titled, you know, not New York's, New York's Future Los Latino. And there's a reason for that. If demographic trends stay more or less the way they are, um, the Latino population of New York City will go even further. We already are the largest minority group in the city of New York. Uh, that will change dramatically if these trends continue. So we are, Latinos are 34% of the under 16 population. That should not surprise any one of us who sits on the street corner and watches kids walking in and out of public schools. Public school enrollment always gives you a good indicator that demographic change is about to happen in any city, right? But we're focused on 16 to 24, and we are also, Latinos generally are the largest group, 32.6% of all 16 to 24 year olds. If we go to the next slide, that translates into 327,000 Latino youth between the ages of 16 and 24. 327,000, that's the figure you should look at and try to dissect every time we give you a proportionate indicator on these reports. The data, ACS data, permitted us to do, to disaggregate Latinos, and as a result, we're able to give you the figures that we have here. So the largest group is Dominican at 29%, the second largest group is Puerto Rican at 26%, the third largest group is Mexican at 13%. So that's your order and rank order. First Dominican, then Puerto Rican, then Mexican. Someone try to guess for me, what is the next largest national origin youth group in the city of New York? Colombia. Colombia. Gassi. Cuban? No. Ecuadorian. Ecuadorian. <laughs> Ecuadorians at 8%, Colombians at 3%. By the way, a year ago, I would have guessed Colombian too. You know, say don't they, I've been. Um, but it's Ecuadorian. 8% and 3%. So those are your top five in that particular order. Um, if we, we can go to the next one. Many of them are born in the United States. This is a very critical finding as well. Um, Nearly all the Puerto Rican in, in, in New York City, Puerto Ricans between 16 and 24 are born in the United States, and many of them are born right here in New York City. The majority of Dominican youth are born in the United States. The majority of other Latino groups, that includes your Ecuadorians and Colombians, etc., are born in the United States. The only exception to this figure are Mexican youth. 72% are born outside of the United States. 
So they're the outliers in this particular respect. 85% of all Latino youth, 85% of the 327,000, report speaking English well or very well. So the title of the slide is that English is not the issue. Or there should be the title of that slide, I don't know what it was, but there it is. Language is not the issue. Um, the point of the matter is, and this goes to a discussion we can have later on about what are the policy recommendations and, and potential solutions to the next slides and the problems they represent. Um, it's not going to be English. Well, at least I should say, it's not going to be English for two dominant groups of Mexicans and Dominicans. It will clearly be English for Mexicans and Ecuadorians, who, by the way, report that about 10% of them do not speak English at all. So if you want to target English language learning, English language skill building, you have to target it to those particular groups, not to Dominicans and Puerto Ricans. If we can go to the next slide. Um, school and work. This is uh, highest levels attained for youth, Asian, black, and Latino. And Latinos have the highest proportion of people, Latino youth, without a high school diploma throughout the city, of all the other groups that we're talking about in this subset. Um, that's driven mostly by the immigrants in the, in the, in the 327,000 sample. But so when you look at native born, uh, at the bottom of the slide, it's about 34% of Latinos do not have uh, a high school diploma, and that's still the highest among native born blacks, Asians, and, and whites. If we go to the next slide, It'll give you a breakdown of Puerto Rican, Dominican, Mexican, male and female. The numbers are startling, especially for the purposes of this conference. Puerto Rican males are almost at 42% without a high school diploma. Um, that only compares to the Mexican young men, because they have a high proportion of not having a high school diploma. Puerto Rican females virtually are higher than any group or tied with other Latinos. Um, and then it has the distribution between who's going to college and who has degrees across the board. If you go to the next slide, this is a very critical slide. This is a slide that gives us the disconnected youth rate for blacks, Asians, and Latinos. The disconnected youth rate in the data that is in this report between 2006 and 2008 demonstrates that the disconnected rate, not in school, not in the labor force, for Latino youth is virtually the same for African American youth. 13.7 versus 13.8. Um, now if we go, if we break it down further between uh, national object groups, I believe that's on the next slide, we're looking at significant issues. In fact, if you go back, um, can you go back on that? But that's it. Look at the top level. The top column gives you, the top uh, line gives you not in school but employed. So on the top line, Latinos are working at very high rates, higher than whites, higher than Asians, higher than blacks. In fact, 28% of Latino youth are working. They're in the labor market. They actually have a job. But that alone would disguise the fact that's being driven by Mexicans. That's being driven by the Mexican numbers. If we had stopped the presentation at this, I could have told you, well, we have low school enrollment for Latino youth, but hey, we got great jobs that participation for Latino youth, and it doesn't tell you the story. The next slide, as I was trying to say before, then will give you the breakdown. 49.5% of Mexican youth are employed. Los mexicanos llegan a Nueva York para trabajar, para trabajar, para trabajar. This is not a, this is not an assessment of what kind of work they have whether it pays minimum wage, whether it's safe, whether they're getting paid at all. It's just the reality of how, how the Mexican population uh, addresses issues of labor market participation in the city of New York. Puerto Ricans are not employed. Dominicans are not employed at, the same, uh, at those kind of numbers. But few people are. If you go down, the, next, the, the third line is the DY line, disconnected youth line. And that shows you that Mexicans uh, slightly above the, in this connection to Puerto Rican youth, 18.62 versus 17.8. But Puerto Rican youth at 17.8 is higher than their counterparts in the white community, black community, or Asian community. So that's an important number. What would drive then the Mexican DY rate, besides the fact that they're not going to school, 
is the distinction between male and female youth. And I think that's on the next slide. And that's what it is. Mexican men are coming to New York City are employed at an astronomical rate of 68% of the youth. Again, 16 to 24. And then, <coughs> excuse me, but Mexican women are disconnected at the rate of 33.9. There's a feature there between Mexican young men and Mexican young women that this report is not able, is not able to explain. But the real critical issues now are Puerto Ricans. 16.7% of men are disconnected. 18.7% of, of, of uh, Puerto Rican women are disconnected. The Dominican figures show you significant attachment to schooling, especially by Dominican women. But it also com confirms uh, the issues regarding Puerto Rican, both men and females, and disconnection rates. If we go to the next slides, I think I'm only gonna do one slide on this one. Let's go to the next slide after that. Uh, the bottom line is Latinos are found in households that are poor households. This is 100% of the federal poverty levels. Uh, more so than any other groups of whites, Asians, or Latino, uh, or blacks. And then the Puerto Rican figures are as follows. Puerto Ricans have to live in higher proportions in poor households compared to Mexicans and Dominicans and other Latinos. But Puerto Ricans also live in households high proportion households compared to Mexican and Dominicans at higher incomes, 400% of the poverty levels. That means the Puerto Ricans se encuentran acá y acá. And something's happening with the middle. A moderate income distribution patterns are not holding up for Puerto Rican households. So I think I will stop there and just give you two minutes then on, two couple of seconds on, on the reaction that, that has fed to this report. The uh, question arises that Puerto Ricans, as a total national community, are about 25% in New York. Would you hazard a guess that these statistics would hold up if you looked at Puerto Ricans across the country? I uh, wouldn't. That, that's going to be my talk. Yeah, that, oh, good. Okay. Perfect. I get it. Evan's going to be able to answer the question. I'm glad. I'm, I'm going to say it. I'm fun. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Uh, Luis, I think uh, Evan can deal with that. The, the question then becomes, the kind of reaction, you know, the, 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 the fact that the labor market in New York City is, does not, has not been able to absorb youth and has been a particular problem has gone on for quite a number of years in the data that addresses youth in New York City. Um, Hector Cordero Guzman is here. I was able to find one of his articles a long time ago that basically confirmed that for youth, this goes way back, ¿verdad? El 80. Uh, essentially, young Puerto Rican males are going to school at a higher rate for participating less in the formal labor market. It's not the first time that CSS, where I work, has issued a report that addresses Puerto Ricans in poverty. And we'll go back, there's a wonderful citation to a report by Terry Rosenberg at CSS that goes back to the 1980s. and talks about, well, for whatever the reasons, Puerto Ricans are found at the lower end of the social economic class in New York City. But I raised several questions that I can't have the answers for, but maybe some of you can help me through the course of today. The reaction that we got also reflects some of this. One is, the first reaction that we got was, no puede ser, it's impossible. Puerto Ricans cannot have these lower numbers compared to Mexicans and Dominicans, because Puerto Ricans were here first. Juan, you got your data wrong. Um, so we had to go through that. Um, now the data is the data. The data is census data. It's based on the ACS. Somebody picks up a phone, somebody answers the phone, somebody gives answers. So the first thing you should know is when I say that English is not a problem, as Luis Reyes once told me very recently, it's self-reported English proficiency data. data. But that's it's the nature of the beast. All census data is effectively self-reported. And there's a bias in trying to make yourself look good to whoever's on the other side of the phone. So we're not talking about English proficiency at the level of academic, academic proficiency or able to uh, proficiency in terms of the workplace. At the same time, then became questions about what the data reveals, and this is very fascinating. Um, I had heard anecdotally for many years, yeah, I guess since I'm gonna talk about things that only Puerto Ricans talked about amongst themselves. But I heard anecdotally that there always been questions about the census data and its capturing of the real phenomenon of Puerto Rican households, because there's a lot of people who are undocumented Latinos who say they're Puerto Rican mm -hmm. when they answer census information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, anecdote is me. There might be some interesting phenomena. I mean, Clara Rodriguez once said that a lot of the problems with the, 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 the reporting on poverty in Puerto Ricans, and this was in response to that incredible little article that came out in the New York Times, I think it was front page years ago, the animal fight going wrote about mm -hmm. the waning of the Puerto Rican community. Yes, yeah. Why was it called why was it called waning when, when Puerto Ricanos at that time was still like eight hundred thousand strong in New York City? I'm not sure that could be waning with eight hundred thousand people. But that'd be actually for Clara was, you know, a lot of the problem with the data is that A, it, it is census data. B, it might be not, it may not be capturing the same people given the out migration, in migration of Puerto Rican in New York City. And C, and she raised this, it could very well be that it's capturing people who are not really Puerto Rican. And that's actually the first time I've seen that document. But you can help me figure that out later. Um, the second reaction was then, um, this is amazing. Finally, I got something in my hand that I can wave. For workforce development operations in New York City, they were saying, finally, I have a document that I can wave that just because I don't have an ELL component as part of my workforce development menu, I've been criticized for, quote, unquote, not being able to reach Latino youth. Well, the fact is, you don't need an ELL component to, to reach the much, far majority of Latino youth if you're in a workforce development shop. So people were waving the report saying, this is excellent. And finally, there was another segment of people who were saying, what you're telling us, Cartagena, is nothing we didn't already know. We already know that Puerto Rican youth are not responding to our efforts to try to get them involved in scholarships, to try to get them involved in job training, to try to get them involved in higher education, community colleges, etc. This report finally helps us make the case that we need a targeted approaches. So this particular report was taken within days of its publication, of its uh, release publicly and was waved around in the steps of City Hall by people, mothers, and Puerto Rican women who were very active in, in very various community groups and saying something has to be done in City Hall. <laughs> Anoche, I was in front of 300 people talking about this, and all, mostly Puerto Rican groups, all Christians, an incredible reaction to this report. Uh, with about four respondents, most of them are pastors in, in the youth ministries. Um, but the, it's called Compas, and it's a, a collection of of the clergy um, that is actually looking for so that has been working on issues of social justice, <laughs> and they use this report to galvanize a discussion about what we're going to do next. And some of the reactions was, was fascinating. A young woman said, "You know, there is a problem with the term disconnection," and I admit that disconnected is a term that has baggage. Mm -hmm. It assumes that the young people that we're talking about are somehow defective when they're not. It actually even assumes that they might be. Stupid, but they're not. Um, besides, the flip side is, if you are connected, what are you connected to? I mean, to the extent that you're connected and going to school, but the schools are still not producing the right results, then you're not connected to anything that's going to make you life any, any particular better, or better in any particular real sense. And if, connect, if you are connected to a job, is the job going to lead you to a better job in the future? In some ways, therefore, we are looking at issues that address the panoply of what we call the human capital needs of the city of New York. And we were able to finally do some work as well at CSS to address those issues in another report called Closing the Skills Gap. And you know that there's a Dominic Oh. So there are there are some issues regarding, of course, the gap. And here they reflect on the following themes. Of course, New York City is going to be able to, to create jobs as it has always in, in good and bad times, but those jobs are going to be requiring what are called knowledge workers. So the more, high, the more skills you need in order to get jobs, the people who have not been able to secure the kind of skills in the current school systems are going to be a disadvantage. Two, there's an aging out problem of workers in New York City. And the aging out problem is severe in construction, nursing, severe. There's a bunch of jobs that are going to be able to be created throughout the city of New York that we need to be paying attention to because of their um, aging out issues. Transportation workers, both air, truck, maintenance and repair, HVAC, home appliance repair. There's a group called um, STEP, okay, Skills to Compete New York, which estimates that between now and the year 2014, about 40% of the jobs that are gonna be available in New York City are requiring what are called middle skills. That is, you don't need a four, you don't need a VA to get these jobs, but you're definitely going to need some post-secondary education, and a social degree otherwise. 
nurses, carpenters, electricians, supervisors of office workers, computer supports, advertising sales agents. Other mental skills have been documented as, as going to be required for a course for licensed practical and vocational nursing, maintenance and repair, accountants and auditors and sales reps. So the gap between the current workforce and what is likely to be some job creation in New York City is major. Um, what this report does, and this I'll end with this, is present a figure or a series of issues regarding 327,000 youth, many of them in the tens of thousands, scores of thousands, are disconnected and not prepared. But it presents a crisis for today. It would be wonderful if we could sit here and talk about educational outcomes in the education panel later on, and talk about issues like fourth grade proficiency levels, and teaching about various things for the test of this proficiency level, the high school level, fourth grade, even preschool head start. If that fixes the problem, it will fix the problem for that generation of youngsters. This report is not about the under 16 population. This report addresses a, a very direct issue today of the young men and women who have no job, no likelihood for a job unless they get prepared, and are not going to teach in school or work especially. And in some ways, when we wrote the report, we did it descriptively. It would have taken me another year to write a report with excellent recommendations, of policy solutions. We at CSS have had some ideas about policy solutions. They revolve around GED. They revolve around workforce development. And they revolve around getting rid of the barriers that impede work for people who finally do want to work. And those barriers are ensconced in the criminal justice system. I do a lot of work on that. I have lawyers who all they do is represent individuals with criminal histories, and all they want to do is get a job. And I sue people left and right for that. So I have some ideas of solutions, but it would have taken me another year to do the report. In many ways, the report and people are taking it and running with it. And to that end, it's successful. But whether it's actually going to move anything and move us to a point of actually creating policy solutions is a major issue. We just had the mayor yesterday, along with uh, the Secretary of Education, Arnie Duncan, uh, uh, announced that New York City would become the pilot city for uh, changes in the GED test. In large part because New York City's population of, of GED takers, test takers, is the, one of the most diverse in the entire country. So if they can figure it out here, they can figure it out for the rest of the country. Latinos are the, the plurality of all persons who take the GED. That's in that basic skills report that I mentioned before from CSS. It has taken CSS over two years to get the mayor to talk about GED. And this is two years of advocacy at, with Joe Klein, with Dennis Walcott, with everybody you can think of. With, with Meryl Tisch over at, at the Regents talking about, yeah, it's a crisis and we're gonna make sure we're not, we're not gonna cut funding. Okay, they cut funding immediately. And we had to fight to restore budget cuts. Policy change in this environment requires a level, a, playing, a, a, a field of playing that interaction at multiple fronts. The beauty is that we can try to galvanize the 300 people who came out last night in the kind of like fancy press conference that the mayor holds with the Secretary of Education and try to bridge those issues in a way to try to move this ball along. Because at stake is obviously the, the fate of Latino youth in the city of New York. And by definition, y por ende, all the Latinos in the city of New York. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Very much appreciative of, of that important uh, presentation. That really does help set the tone, um, and I think you're going to be in store for even more startling uh, data as we go throughout uh, this morning. Uh, but next uh, is our, pre our next presenter is the director of the Center, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, uh, Edwin Melendez, who's going to give us a, a, a synopsis of the situation around poverty. Gracias, José Luis, and gracias, Juan. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. 
Uh, buenos días a todos. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to try to uh, follow up on, on the big steps that, that we just heard. Uh, I think you want to go to the, to the PowerPoint. Uh, let me, while we get ready, let me just thank Jose Luis for all his hard work in putting this uh, conference together and, and Rosalie Roman. Louder? I may not have the projection that my prior speaker <laughs> had. <clears throat> let me try my best. I just want to start by thanking uh, uh, Jose Luis Morin for putting all this together, the competition, the support to the scholars that are going to be presenting today, and to our staff, particularly uh, Rosalie Roman, who orchestrated all the logistics of this, and to Anne Visser, because uh, <laughs> data crunching for us. Uh, so with that, I, I uh, like to uh, provide now an overview of what's going on in the nation, a complement to what uh, uh, Juan just did for us. Uh, so uh, uh, what I'm going to start with are some uh, facts about poverty nationally. And in contrast to Juan, who used a combined uh, uh, data set because of the size of New York uh, data sample, in the ACS, I'm going to rely on the one-year uh, ACS data, and I'm just going to report data for which there is enough sample in, uh, to report to report the data. Having said that, after I do that, I'm going to try to link uh, poverty to labor market uh, positioning and standing, and I think that's the core of the matter. Uh, I think since poverty is so broad in terms of affecting health outcomes and education and, and what have you, uh, all social conditions, I think it's a good point of entry for our, our conversations today. Uh, at the end, I will very briefly, like one suggests, mention a few uh, items in regard to what is it that we can do. Uh, the specificity of what we're going to do comes at the end, after we have a, 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 a time to dissect uh, some of the presentations that we're going to discuss today. So uh, why don't we go to the, to the first slide. Uh, by the way, there is a handout, and if someone uh, can help me distribute that, I don't know if you already got it. Uh, I have very detailed, uh, no, uh, it's not a three-pager, it's uh, more like a ten-pager. Uh, and uh, Anne, can you check if, if we, and the reason why I gave you a handout is because there's too much data, and I, I hope this is more, the handout is more detailed than what I'm going to present, and hopefully you can take it home. And, uh, and follow up uh, with uh, your work based on a, a, a broader perspective than what I have time to present here today. So the, 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 the first uh, overview of poverty and what I did was to compare it to uh, all the population and to uh, the Latino population is that you know, Puerto Rican rates are a bit higher than Latinos and almost double uh, the, the poverty rate for all families. This is national data now that we're reporting. Uh, and I did a little bit of a breakdown because the other point that I'd like to impress upon you today is that it's pretty much a, a gender issue when you talk about, about poverty. You cannot address the issue of poverty without addressing the situation of, of female-headed households. And, uh, and more to the point, if you look at the rates of Puerto Rican children under five that live with a female head of household, it is just heartbreaking to, to see those numbers. And, uh, and we, we're torn apart in our community because at the same time, we have a very successful group of people, professionals like the ones in this room. There are so many people left behind, particularly children, that have very little to do with the circumstances that surround them. And uh, though the parents and, and the community are, are shaped by, by broader forces that we need still to understand. Uh, when, uh, uh, you know, the data is there, disaggregated. I think the, the most telling uh, figure is that 53% children living with female head of household. Now, uh, if you thought that news from New York were bad, let us move through the national uh, outcome. I think uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, a telling tale. So why don't we go to, uh, to just pass that slide. Let's just go to that slide where I try to uh, break it down for all the areas for which there is acceptable sample size in the ACS for the Puerto Rican community. 
as you can see, it's a, you know, I got to disaggregate New York in a little while. But what this data suggests, if you just look, this is all for Puerto Ricans by different places, you can see the range of, uh, of, uh, of the poverty rate at the national level. But pay attention to that third column, okay? There are countless places where the chances of a, ch of a child, five years old, living with a female head of household, is more than 50%. Chances are better to be in poverty than not to be in poverty. The odds are against those kids. Now, how that plays out in schools, how that plays out in the criminal justice system, how that plays out in detachment from the labor force, you know, it's for the panelists to try to tease out. But this is the reality that we're facing. Uh, if we can move on to, I, I'm going to skip to the to the explanation. You can make your own judgments on that. I just want to highlight some data. So in here, what I wanted to do was to start uh, decomposing by areas. And here we have uh, in the net, in this slide we have uh, the boroughs, uh, the counties, which is about the smallest uh, uh, geography that I can uh, pull data for. And what you can see is that, you know, uh, Manhattan is not particularly bad compared to the Bronx and so forth. Uh, the poverty rates in New York, uh, you know, for the whole, uh, for the city as a whole, uh, of, for the New York State actually, is 26% uh, versus 10% for all the other uh, families. Uh, in New York City, it's about double, uh, you know, 27 to 15.8. Uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, again, the situation of female head of households and, and for children living in households where he, uh, headed by women, uh, the situation is, is worse across the board. Uh, the, so the data, in very much detail, is in your handout. You can <coughs> probably dissect that over time. I just want to provide you a quick overview. Now, uh, though I know uh, 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 you know, economists sometimes overdo the whole question of modeling and, and try to create conceptual frameworks to understand things. Uh, well, that's my training, and I gotta uh, tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, this is used to then develop measures that will tell you the odds that people will be in a situation, in, a, in poverty, given various components, whether you speak English, whether you are in a female head of households, and this and that. But I don't wanna go that, I don't, I don't want to bother you with that right now. What I want to emphasize with this diagram is that poverty is primarily a question of having access to earnings. And in a market economy, the way to get access to earnings is to work. So when you have problems connecting to the workplace, everything else follows. When you have problems advancing your skills, when you have problems advancing your experience, everything follows from that. So I might be uh, too narrow on this labor market situation uh, piece, but it's the only way I can understand these numbers, is the accumulation of that experience, the accumulation of those skills that you gain through uh, education and training that eventually will, will trickle. Now, that's not to uh, say that only us are responsible for the situation that we are in labor market. It depends on our connections to the labor market. Well, maybe our networks to the workplace were broken after the decline of manufacturing way back in the 70s. We, it's well documented that women withdrew from the labor force. Jobs disappear. It, and we can go on and on telling stories about the structural factors that affect the poverty and employment and so on and so forth. So uh, with, with that in mind, uh, you know, obviously, uh, uh, Anyway, let's go to the next. I don't want to theorize too much here. Uh, uh, th this graph is uh, uh, about the punchline of what's going on. Now, if poverty is all about unemployment, okay, what this graph is telling you, which actually comes from the Federal Reserve, uh, 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 the, uh, Federal Reserve, and its data that, uh, from the uh, uh, various sources. Uh, uh, what you can see is that this current recession, the period, that, that, that shaded area, okay, is bigger than anything in the graph. Well, I'm going to tell you, it's bigger than anything since the Great Depression. The duration of that, of this particular recession, is longer than any prior recession. The oil crisis of the 70s, not even close, okay? 
the, the early 80s, not even close. Now, there is another telling story here. Look at the duration of unemployment. It goes off the charts, even higher than the Great Depression, the duration of employment. So my point is that if you are employed, the chances that you will be re-employed, okay, the average now, uh, I have somewhere, is about 33.8 weeks. But it has been climbing, it's not going down. Okay? Now that's not to say people are discouraged and are not looking for jobs and are not counting this number. So the non-participation rate, the detachment that we, that Juan was talking about, about the, uh, the, the young people, it's broader, much broader for women in, uh, uh, in particular in the labor force. Also for men, but uh, for uh, female head of households is a particularly uh, telling problem. So if we go to the to the next uh, to the next slide, I'm trying now to decompose the the young uh, uh, the youth from the more uh, the, the 26 and plus population and try to break it down so that we try to understand a little better this notion of the working poor. Okay, Puerto Ricans have one of the highest rates of working and being poor. So my next point, my, what I want to leave behind with you today, is that this is largely a lead, an issue of low wages. It's not just that some, we're not in the labor force or that we are employed. When we get to, the, to, to jobs, those jobs don't pay enough to sustain a family and to lift us above poverty. So this is a complex problem. Because now it's not just that you want to be attached to the labor force or you're looking for work, it's that when you do attach, the networks and the connections that you have lead you to very low wage employment, and that's a problem. Uh, how do we connect, how do we create those pathways? Uh, well, that's the subject of another conference. Um, so, um, oh, yeah, 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 go, go to the next, go to the next. Uh, uh, I need to speed up, we're running a little bit out of time. So, I wanted now to comment, uh, in terms of the working poor, uh, it's, it, they have three characteristics, three type of problems that each one of them may be complicated to solve, okay? Uh, and that refers to the low wage, as you can see that's the most important one, but there's also the question of unemployment and part-time employment, or part-year employment, when you don't generate enough hours uh, of employment to lift you uh, above the poverty line. So when those things are compounded, you can see how the poverty rate of those that are working poor climbs up. So if you have all three conditions, if you're in part-time employment and you are intermittent employment, part-year employment, and you are in low wages, the chances that, that you're going to be a working poor are almost 50%. Okay. So even getting jobs might not be enough to, uh, to take us beyond where we are at this point. In, in the, this is data for everyone. I'm sorry, I, I didn't have it. <laughs> It was a long story why I couldn't do that for Puerto Ricans, but I, I promise you, by the time the paper gets out, it's going to be done. Uh, mostly, I did this yesterday, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I take full responsibility for it. I, I almost. We're uh, working for it. The paper will come, I promise. So now I want to turn uh, uh, to the next uh, slide. Uh, right there, right there, okay. So when we look at when, what Juan started to tease out, of what is the, the, uh, the strategy to overcome this problem that underlies poverty, which has to do with labor markets, in my opinion, right? Now, that's not to say that other things are not important, because health is important, and mental health is important for people to be in the workforce. You know, you know how depressed people get when they can't support their own and, and their family? I mean, por favor. So all of these are things are in, uh, in, in, interlocked. You don't advance in school because they put you down, or it's, you know it's a push factor as opposed to a welcome factor, and so so you can't just you can't separate the problem of labor market from all these other spheres of of, uh, of social life, institutions, and conditions. But so uh, uh, given that we're the chances that we're going to affect the market economy over the next few decades are very limited. You know, I'm sorry to to tell you. The question is, within the context of what we are, how can we improve the living standards of our population? Okay, and policies matter. Food stamp matter. Uh, uh, low income tax credit matter. Uh, you know, FDIC matter, and so on. You know, uh, welfare support for families that uh, 
all of those things need to be put together. Because if we cannot change the market economy too quickly, yes, we can affect the distribution of, the, of poverty and so forth with our own community efforts. But the chances are that that alone is not going to be sufficient. That we need a, a complementary set of, of policies and strategies that will mitigate uh, what the market economies create. The only way to eliminate poverty, by the way, is to eliminate the market economy. I mean, it's no other way, because it's embedded within the system to create disadvantage and inequality. It's just embedded within the system. So given that we're not going to get there any time, what can we do to improve the living standards of our community? Community development matters. A better place to live, right? Uh, support income matters. GED matters, okay? So we need a multi-phase strategy to attack this problem. Can, it's not that it is piecemeal. We make it a whole, but it has to be very focused mm -hmm. on the things that we can affect to better the conditions of our community, I think. Uh, and then finally, uh, this slide is about the complexity of the challenge that Luis, uh, 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 th that, uh, that we have poised to that, okay? The workforce development uh, connection is not a simple one. It's a, a multi-phase number of actors and institutions. Now, how many people here are at CUNY? 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 Okay, there's something we can do there, okay? How many of people here are on community-based organizations? Okay, there's something we can do there. And I can go on and on and on. It is with us that the intervention starts, but the, with the netting, the connections of these people is so important. The collaboration between CUNY and community-based organizations, between uh, all these actors, is so important to create a network that actually will reconstruct those networks for our community to hook up, you know, the aspira of all years. How many of you are aspirantes here? Okay. Well, yeah, okay. The leadership is aspirant. So anyway, we need more of those. <laughs> now, uh, in conclusion, let's get to work. Let's let's just do something about it. Thank you. We can have tend to have high rates of uh, BMI, body mass index, uh, high blood pressure, uh, rates of diabetes, hypertension asthma, uh, death from heart disease, uh, infant mortality, low uh, birth weight rates, cancer, particularly stomach, liver, and uh, cervical cancer, uh, high rates of HIV infection um, uh, compared to other uh, US Latinos, uh, high disability rates is a big problem. And I could go on and on and on and talk about some of the disparities. We're talking about it better. Apparently. And, uh, but the, the question is, and this is the big question for people interested in doing work in this area, is why? Why do we have this, this, this big disparity? It's, it's whether you, you're a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a sociologist, a social work, most of the work being done in this area is documenting those differences. But we haven't really mm -hmm. spoken about why those differences are there uh, in the first place. So as a sociologist, I'm interested in uh, structural uh, causes mm -hmm. of health, uh, particularly uh, growing up, uh, in uh, segregated poor communities, I uh, was interested in segregation, the effect segregation it has on, uh, on health. So, uh, but in this area, uh, especially, particularly multi-level studies on segregation and health, there are only about uh, 22 studies right now for all groups, including African Americans, different uh, Latino groups. Uh, and the big question is, what are the pathways? There are two, actually two, uh, several research questions that emerge in this area, but one is, what are the pathways that link segregation uh, to health? So uh, for this presentation, I actually came up with um, a conceptual model. I make this up. Let me you get it, you get it? I, 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 can, I can do the clicking while you do the talking. Yeah. Okay. Still the not working. There we go. There's my conceptual. Oh, you can't really see it very clearly, but I'll point some of the things uh, that appear in this model. If you look at the top, stay here, at the top uh, box here, uh, this is the effect of residential uh, segregation. Uh, and the hypothesis is a several research question. One is that we should find a direct link between segregation and different health problems. The literature 
uh, particularly the work on David, of David Williams on African Americans, shows, this is a population level study, strong linkages between segregation and population health, uh, both physical health uh, and mental health. But when it comes to mental, uh, uh, multi-level studies, not population, so population will be comparing rates of uh, segregation across cities or across neighborhoods. Uh, when we talk about multi-level studies, we're talking about segregation as a characteristic of place and then health being a characteristic uh, of individuals. That's a lot more uh, complicated to actually model. The many, many linkages, and this, this here is what I call, it's, instead of calling it a black box, I call it a Puerto Rican box, or Puerto Rican boxes. So there are many path, path, what I call pathways that link segregation uh, to poor health. And here, um, so I, I'm thinking of segregation as a macro level uh, social uh, uh, structure, such as uh, that takes place at the city level, at the metropolitan area level, at the county level. These areas with high segregation, the research has shown, uh, sociological research and research by economists, that people who live in segregated areas leads to, in the work of William Wilson here, uh, leads to concentrated uh, poverty at the neighborhood levels. Okay? So segregation leads to poverty, uh, high rates of joblessness, uh, um, uh, uh, low levels of uh, uh, high school graduation, uh, poor uh, college attendance, and so on. It also leads, in the work of Acevedo uh, Garcia at Harvard, she talks about the work that segregation may li be linked to health because it's associated with uh, lack of access to healthcare facilities. So doctors who are board certified, um, uh, specialists, people who have access to the latest equipment. Uh, segregation also leads to toxic uh, environments, uh, such as uh, you know, having uh, dilapidated buildings, uh, air pollution, uh, and so on, lack of parks and recreation, all these community factors that promote a hate, healthy lifestyles and well-being. Okay? Then, so this is uh, a segregation at a macro level, we have segregation at a meso, uh, the effect of segregation at a more meso level, community, which I'm conceptualizing. And then we have these individual level factors that people, when, when they talk about racial and ethnic disparities in health, they tend to focus on immediate causes, and they're kind of forgetting the structural causes that, that are linked to health. So here we have human capital, which Elwin Melendez and the, the keynote speaker uh, spoke about one. Uh, human capital, we're talking about levels, when I talk about human capital, I'm talking about human capital in the, in the way the sociologists and economists have talked about human capital, so meaning SDS, education, income, occupational prestige, uh, wealth. Then we have social capital, which are network ties, social support, uh, collective efficacy, and a lot of the work of criminologists are talking about uh, these, uh, these social capital variables. Cultural capital, this is the one that has received a lot of attention in the literature, cultural capital. You know, the work of Oscar Lewis, talking about the, 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 the individuals feel demoralized, have poor work ethic, um, uh, they don't value family, and so on. So this, this, this explanation tends to receive a lot of attention, it still it tends to receive a lot of attention uh, in the literature. And then we have also stressors. I mean, there are all the, all the many other pathways, but these, these are the pathways that I'm actually uh, testing in my own work. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the, only this box. Uh, these are the, you know, the other pathways, there are other papers. And then we have stress, such as life events, chronic stress. If you're a stress uh, researcher, uh, there's a lot of work to be done here, uh, including discrimination stress. And then the internist factors link segregation to, to health. That's also it's a, a very sociological explanation needs to really take into account how individuals are embedded within these different layers of disadvantage. And until re fairly recently, this is pretty difficult to, uh, to model for, for several reasons. The, the, the computing power wasn't there, but also the data uh, wasn't publicly available. So I think those problems are easily coming to be fixed. Uh, next slide. Let me see if I can do the next slide here. So let me talk about a generic conceptual model. What I want to do is study, let's see if we can break it down more simply, how segregation is related to, more generally, to life chances. Okay. So in this case, will be the link between segregation and disability. We'll talk about that in the next couple of slides. So that's pathway A. And whether the links between segregation and health are mediated 
by the different pathways, those boxes that were in the middle. Well, that would be great. And then and today I'm going to be talking about social economic status. Again, and so that's uh, pathway B, and then the next uh, pathway C is whether this relationship between segregation and health, which you expect to be there, disappears once we take into account uh, the effect of the media. So that's essentially the, the basic idea behind a, a seemingly uh, complex uh, statistical model. Uh, let's move um, on. So three research questions. I'm interested in using the American Community Survey uh, in the U.S. Census data, whether uh, county level segregation, you know, again, we can measure segregation at different levels, at the city level, at the metropolitan area level, and at the county level. But this is a spin-off from another um, study that actually was published in the Central Journal. So the first question is, does, does, it, does county level segregation affect disability among Puerto Ricans, individuals in the U.S.? <laughs> Second question is, does segregation affect the socioeconomic status of Puerto Rican individuals? And the third question is, does SES mediate the relationship between segregation and disability? To put it simply, I want to know whether segregation still affects uh, health once we take into account the people's social economic status. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an important question, um, both theoretically and sociologically. So let's move on to the next uh, data methods. I'm using the 2000 American Community Survey uh, to get uh, data on individuals. I linked that. I actually spent a, a big chunk of last summer working with um, William Bellis trying to crack the code of how to get county codes from the American Community Survey, and now they have them. Uh, so now I have to get the articles out quicker because people get beat me to the punch. Uh, but the American Community Survey actually has the county identifiers, which is great um, for people doing work in this area. So I linked those two files, the American Community Survey, to the uh, U.S. Census. So the, correct, the structural characteristics of my data come from, uh, are at the county level, and my individual level variables are from the American Community Survey. Uh, the statistical model, I'm using hierarchical and linear modeling. I won't spend too much time on that. Uh, talk about some of the variables that I use. So for the disability variables, I have uh, sensory, whether the person has problems hearing, or seeing, whether the person has uh, problems, physical health, uh, disability problems, such as walking, climbing stairs, uh, lifting, crying, mental health problems, learning, remembering, concentrating, whether the person has self-care problems, such as dressing uh, and bathing, the other one's mobility problems. This is the standard disability question that, that the census uh, provides. And, and that's actually the benefit, because if you're working with different census data, you can actually compare your, your, your findings to, uh, to other studies. Uh, and the way I created my disability variable is a person say yes to any of the questions, they got a one, so I have a logic model. If they said uh, n uh, otherwise, they get, they, they get, they get a zero. Okay? Um, I, I think that talk about that in future research, but I want to, what I want to do is really look at the effects of segregation on each of the variables instead of combining them together. Um, but that's the that's issue that we can talk about in the discussion. Then have the level one controls, such as age, whether the person male, married. Um, I did a study on, on uh, this is a controversial one, uh, whether there's a person of black Puerto Rican or a non-black Puerto Rican, which I call that the deniers. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See, it's great being in New York because people understand that joke. <laughs> when I do this in Canada, people look at me like I'm very inappropriate. But anyway, it might be inappropriate. Uh, but I did another study where I looked at the effect of discrimination on, on, on depression and found racial differences among Latinos. So, race, we know race is important among the Latino population, and we try to pretend that it's not. But anyway. Um, uh, Personal income, so these are my human capital variables. Personal income, occupational prestige, uh, and then education. Okay? And then this, this, my county level variables are from social disorganization theory, concentrated poverty, ethnic heterogeneity, residential instability, and then Puerto, versus Puerto Rican, personal low service occupation. So I have all the structural, uh, stru those structural level variables. And the question is, does segregation have an effect on disability, on the probability of having disability above and beyond these other important structural correlates of health, and does that relationship between segregation and disability disappear once we take into account this human level um, yeah, variables? Pretty, pretty uh, straightforward question. Um, we have five minutes. My iPhone says two. Anyways, <laughs> but you've been very generous. Estoy haciendo trampa. So, uh, the first thing that I wanted to do in this case 
was look at, actually let's go back to one slide really quickly, just to show you that we're uh, comparing uh, the, the mean values on all these variables for, pe for people with disability versus those with disability. And clearly what emerges here is that um, the rates of segregation, if you have a disability, you tend to live in, people tend to live in counties with higher levels of segregation. And that relationship is significant. Also, people with disability also have significantly lower levels of income, education, and occupational prestige. So the key variables are significantly different between those with disability and those without a disability. So let's go to the next slide. Here, well, I'll just focus on the isolation index, which is the uh, uh, segregation index that I'm using. And of course, people who live in counties with high levels of segregation or isolation have lower, have uh, more likely to have a disability. Okay? Three stars. Less likely, uh, uh, increases in disability and segregation are associated with decreases in income. Okay? So incomes are affected by segregation. So is education. And the big hit, I was surprised by, by the magnitude of this coefficient, is occupational prestige. If you live in segregated counties, the chances that you have a, a prestigious occupation are really, really low. When we talk about uh, teachers, uh, and I'm not going to talk about, I'm not going to get, go into that since my colleague, Dr. Mercado, is going to be doing that. Uh, at the last conference, we said we need to prepare teachers with deep knowledge about teaching in the classroom and also knowledge about cultural competence, cultural issues, and build the trust between parents and teachers. Uh, and lastly, the seventh issue was the need to build a network uh, among researchers, policy makers, community organizations, students, uh, both graduate and undergraduate students at the college level, and high school students to build a network to support each other uh, around uh, the education issues. That are. And that also means a partnership with community-based organizations in developing a research agenda and in advocating for improvement. Now, where are we? to just look at uh, some basic numbers, and that is the educational attainment. Before, we were hearing about 16 to 24. The numbers now that I'd like to, that are from the American Community Survey, the uh, census numbers uh, for 2007, talk about adults 25 and over. So the 16 to 24 was the young adult youth. And then for those over, uh, the numbers, what they say in New York City for, for different groups, uh, students who have less than a ninth grades. And here we see 17% of Puerto Ricans as compared to 6% of whites, less than a high school. 21% of Puerto Ricans have less than a high school diploma. Those who have a high school diploma, uh, almost 30%. And these are, this is the highest level of attainment. And this is where we start looking at the pipeline. Uh, put 28% of Puerto Ricans, the highest degree they have is an associate to PhD. So, there are 30% at best of Puerto Ricans have an AA, a BA, an MA, or a PhD, all together. How many, how many have uh, when we, we say bachelor's degree, 18. 
when we look at uh, master's professional, which could be a, a, a doctor, a doctor of law, a, meaning a, a law degree, a medical degree, uh, and a doctor, it's just 11 <coughs> Actually, it's about 5% of Puerto Ricans have a master's degree. And in terms of doctorates, 1%, less, less than 1%. So if we're talking about a pipeline and about jobs, not and where do Puerto Ricans fit into the work force, clearly the outcomes would let you know that very few have, uh, the minority have the the skills to be in managerial and, and certification to be in managerial uh, positions and professional positions. Uh, educational attainment, 38% of adults did not get a high school diploma. More than a third. Two thirds of adults had no college attendance. And so if we're, if we're looking at the pipeline uh, through college, we have a long way to go. And that tells us about that there is a leaky pipeline. Four out of 10 Puerto Rican and Latino youth, excuse me, four out of 10 of all students in the school system are Latino. Uh, and yet, oh, and uh, almost 23% of those Latino students are L's. That means three out of four of Latino students are English dominant and are not eligible for ESL or bilingual instruction. And so the point that uh, Juan was making that in terms of responding to the needs of Latinos, that he, he said that English isn't an issue. I would suggest that to get through a high school, college, and beyond, that academic language is an issue, and, and the self-reported I speak well uh, does not necessarily reflect the kind of skills that are gonna prepare people for a regent's diploma, a undergraduate enrollment, and graduation from undergraduate, and so that's where we start seeing this, uh, even for the Puerto Rican students who are English dominant, the issues of literacy, academic literacy, along with math and science and other skills are still very important. Uh, how bad are things in school? Uh, East Harlem. Last night there was a meeting of the, uh, two nights ago of the uh, Council of Edu the Education Council, which is a, uh, a body in S School District 4, East Harlem, El Barrio, and they were meeting with uh, Deputy Chancellor Santiago Taveras, and uh, they were talking about the progress reports for East Harlem. 22 out of the 46 schools did not meet performance requirements uh, for their schools, which is to say that there are schools with C's and D's and F's on uh, their school performance. And that's based on reading scores and math scores. It's also based on environmental surveys uh, surveys of parents, teachers, and students. It's based on uh, the level of safety or violence in the school and put into a, a school grade. 22 out of 46, we're talking about half of the schools. So East Harlem, uh, as a district, community district, is in crisis. And I, I point to it because it's and it's one of the major neighborhoods that where Puerto Rican and Latino students are. East Harlem, Sunset Park, Bushwick, Williamsburg, the South Bronx, Washington Heights. And we could do that in various uh, dis districts, but th these numbers just happen to uh, jump out. And the reasons why they're important is 
it's a changing community as far as the Latino population, Puerto Rican, uh, Dominican, Mexican, and so the needs are many and solutions relating to the education pipeline for Puerto Ricans cannot be solutions that are only about Puerto Ricans. And so one of my punchlines is that we need to look at the needs of all of the Latino students uh, because there are similarities. Puerto Rican, Dominican, Ecuadorian, uh, Mexican children have similar needs to uh, have literacy in English and hopefully literacy in their first language and knowledge about their own identity and that means that the schools, whether they're Puerto Rican teachers or white teachers or black teachers, need to have a knowledge of the diversity of our community to be prepared and to for the students to be successful. Some of the issues that are raised uh, have to do with in-school conditions. You heard me talk about safety. Uh, we, you heard me talk about the availability of teachers of color. What are some? What do we know about the schools in which uh, mostly Latino youth? We already know that the schools are usually in neighborhoods where there's where there is concentrated poverty. And so we've, we have a sense of that. The, but what's going on in the schools themselves, whether it's in uh, Bushwick, in Sunset Park, or in other places, we have overcrowding of schools. And as schools are being closed because they're underperforming, we have, and charter schools are being brought in to, to co-locate co in those schools. At the high school level, schools are closed. And uh, the students end up being sent to other schools that haven't been closed that are overcrowded. So you have and underfunded uh, schools. Uh, students are in oftentimes homes that where the parents, Latino parents, whether Puerto Rican or immigrant parents, are not don't have access or have not chosen to for center-based uh, daycare, child, uh, and tend to go for family home care. And so we have less access of young people, of children, to uh, literacy-rich environments and, and center-based programs that prepare them. Uh, One of the things that we do, we uh, did not talk, uh, we heard about labor rates of males and females among Puerto Ricans and others, the issue of graduation rates and uh, academic success or failure. And if you look at the uh, Puerto Rican, uh, we don't we can't look at the Puerto Rican data in the, in the city because it's not collected. Uh, as of now, if, if it's collected, it is not released. The school system is only held accountable for talking about uh, people of African descent, Latino, Asian, Native American. And so there is no specific data that's uh, reported. And so this is one of the issues of invisibility. Uh, not being, uh, uh, being counted and, and there being no accountability and, uh, and ability to track and respond to the specific needs. But what we do know is that uh, the graduation dropout crisis among Latino and African American students is aggravated when you break it up by male and female. Not only is there a gap between black Latino students and white and Asian students, but there's a gap between uh, Latino and Latina, Puerto Rican male, Puerto Rican female. And so uh, the, the crisis there is even greater. Uh, I can tell you that there are 46 schools that were being considered for closing, and uh, 26 of them were announced in this past week, and more to come. Uh, Norman Thomas, 
I don't have Puerto Rican data, 70% Latino. Christopher Columbus, 49% Latino. Monroe Academy for Business Law, 70% Latino. And so what I'm telling you uh, is that from a policy perspective, we have a crisis of failing high schools that are being closed down and the programs that heavily impact on our student population and the schools being put in their place oftentimes have not taken into account the uh, issues that we're talking about culturally, responsive pedagogy, uh, bilingual needs of immigrant students, etc. cetera. Uh, you, from a policy perspective, one is led to believe that the answer is higher standards, the answer is uh, accountability, teachers being accountable for their students' grades, as if education by itself can solve all of the problems, uh, but what is not taken into account are the other, th other than school factors that are common among minority and uh, poor students. Things that are present not just at 16 to 24, but uh, early on, low birth weight, uh, inadequate medical dental care, food insecurity, environmental pollutants, neighborhood characteristics of concentration of poverty. And guess what? One of the solutions uh, that has been tried and has been at work in the Harlem Children's Zone is a wraparound services. And uh, in, uh, Jeff Canada is uh, a celebrity nationally because of the work that he's been doing uh, some of it having to do with charter schools, but other of it having to do with providing uh, baby college for children, uh, prenatal uh, and postnatal uh, classes and services for parents, the GED and ESL for parents. And so the, uh, uh, if you lift the parents, they're able to help their own children and their, and their skills give them a better chance to work. Puerto Ricans in New York and throughout the states consistently find themselves in the lowest percentile, right, this was mentioned earlier by Juan, in the lowest percentile of moderate income and in the highest percentile of those living in poverty, right? Over here and over here. Unemployment rates, <coughs> New York City metro area, 2008. The unemployment rate percentage in New York City during this time was 4.5%. Latino unemployment at this time, 6.1%. Puerto Rican unemployment, 6.3%. Mexican unemployment, 3.9%. Again, this was discussed earlier by Juan. And Dominican unemployment at 7.5%. Right, so Puerto Ricans in New York living in poverty, unemployed, <coughs> and they're not graduating, right? They're not receiving their, their graduate the high school diploma. Men, women, percentages, less than a high school degree. So Puerto Rican women, in comparison to Dominican women and Mexican women, have a high percentage to not have a high school degree. What implications does this have on, on single mothers, on young mothers, on poor young mothers? Again, disconnected youth, ages 16 to 34. <coughs> disconnected, the idea, right, that this individual is neither employed or in school. They're just there. They're doing something, right, percentages. In New York City, based on a 2010 CSS, right, Puerto Ricans, Latino men, Latina women, compromise the highest percentage of disconnected youth. Right? This is the social conditions, the context, that makes prison an opportunity, right? A choice. 
The rate of home ownership among Puerto Ricans, 40.3%, is lower than the rate for Latinas overall, which is at 49.1%, and the U.S. population overall, which is at 66.6%. As largely renters, Puerto Ricans tend to live in poorer housing, are more concentrated than most other communities in low-income neighborhoods, and pay a highly disproportionate share of their income on shelter. So most of their income is being spent on rent to provide a, a, a home for your family, which makes other things, right, which limits your opportunity for other things. So what we're trying to do is provide the social conditions, the context that make that make Puerto Ricans vulnerable to the criminal justice system. And then part three is policing in Puerto Rican communities. If you live in a poor neighborhood, you're gonna be targeted by the police. Can I just ask you one question? Yes. You just said something about choice. Could you explain that to me? Uh, makes prison a choice. Now it makes, uh, not, not necessarily a choice, but makes prison, uh, uh, choice is not the correct word. But uh, it, ma it makes more likely because of the fact that they're unemployed. Right, I'm going to use the word choice. It makes, it makes yeah. prison more likely. Yeah, okay. You resort to criminal activity. Yeah, you become, become criminalized. And in this next, you become criminalized. criminalized. And, and in this next mm -hmm. section, it really just shows we will try to tie in how the social conditions in Puerto Rican communities, in particular, right? Are make them uh, especially vulnerable to police tactics um, that target right uh, particular communities. And in fact, the data here is quite startling and um, pretty troubling. As a general phenomenon, we've been looking at and been concerned over a number of years over this this issue of, of racial profiling. Um, back in the late by the late nineties, you had. You know, sheriffs talking about how racial profiling is a tool that we use. This is in Los Angeles. Um, uh, and, and don't let anyone say otherwise. Uh, like up in the valley, we know uh, who's selling crack. Uh, they look like Hispanics who should be cutting your lawn. Uh, this is coming from a deputy sheriff in, in Los Angeles. Um, and how Latinos have also, also seen themselves being affected by discrimination. Um, by the, by the 2000s, right? Uh, eight in 10 describing themselves as having discrimination. Uh, and that discrimination is, uh, is something that affects their, their progress in the society. Um, specifically with regard to racial profiling here in New York City, uh, there have been various reports. Uh, the Attorney General's office, uh, Spitzer, when he was Attorney General, um, engaged in a, in, a, in a look at the whole question of racial profiling. Um, in a 2000, uh, in a 1999 report, uh, race was frequently used as a sole criterion, according to that report. Uh, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in 2000 also came up with um, uh, similar findings. Um, the disparities of the types of activity that police were um, engaging in was actually even apparent back then in 1999. Uh, after accounting for differences in crime rates in communities of colors and white communities in New York uh, City, across all crime categories, Latinos were still stopped by police officers at a rate of 39% um, more than whites. Uh, so that was already back in 1999. Um, similar data was for African Americans, but actually in that Specific data: the Latinos were being stopped even more at a slightly higher rate than, than African Americans. Uh, Chicago this is a nationwide phenomenon. We've also seen this, these tactics being used, especially among uh, African American and Latino youth, uh, oftentimes as they are coming out of school. Um, and in a study done of, uh, of this tactic in Chicago, 80% of African American high school students and 62% of Latino high school students reported being stopped by police with 62 and 63 percent reporting respectively that they were being treated disrespectfully when stopped by uh, the police. Here in New York City, uh, some attention is brought uh, to the whole question of stops and frisks, uh, most, recently, well, most recently because uh, as a result of lawsuits that have been brought against the NYPD to even get the data. Uh, if, you, if you can just think about the, the fact that we we pay taxes to, uh, to, to pay for 
our safety and the NYPD has not been transparent in providing this data, they've had to be, to be sued in order for us to understand what is it that they are actually doing when they're stopping and frisking people. And uh, the, the most recent data for 2009 is even more startling than the data that was previously obtained. Um, for 2008, um, the, well, the, the trajectory has been, since 2003, has been um, upwards in terms of the numbers of stops. Um, New York City police are stopping uh, at the rate of more than a half a million people um, in, in the city uh, a year. 2009 was more than a half a million people. That is up from previous years. Um, and the results are quite remarkable. Um, in the earlier period, up to 2008, 2005 to 2008, about 80% of the people being stopped were African American and Latino. In 2009, 87% uh, of the persons being stopped, close to 90% of the people being stopped by NYPD uh, are African American or Latino. Um, so we're talking about an incredible, right, um, uh, gap here in terms of how uh, African American and Latino communities are actually being targeted um, with, in fact, a minimum of, of weapons being yielded, yielded or, or contraband being yielded. Uh, the data demonstrates that uh, these stops are clearly not producing the kinds of, of recovery of, of contraband. In fact, in, in many instances, the data is showing that the whites that are being stopped are um, are the ones with, with higher levels of can contraband being found than African Americans and Latinos. Uh, that's a very uh, interesting uh, phenomenon because in other states where, where stops and frisk tactics are, used, are being used, the same results have been happening. The whites have been, who are being stopped at a much lower rate or have been more likely to have been found with, with higher levels of contraband. Um, so we're seeing a pattern now uh, nationally, not just simply in New York. Let's, let's talk about the increments. This graph says very clearly what's been going on. The number of stops and frisks, uh, the stops in, uh, have been occurring since 2003 have been skyrocketing more than a, uh, a half a million uh, uh, currently in 2009. And the reasons for these stops uh, are actually astounding. Uh, the number one reason, uh, which is almost 50% of the time, are furtive movements. As any suspicious kind of movement, whatever that might be. Um, you just did it by now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, uh, of course, you know the, the suspicious bulge. That's a, that's another one. Uh, clothes commonly used in crime. So I guess if they wanted to go after white collar criminals, they'll go after somebody with a suit and tie. I, you know what? What does that really mean? Um, and so you can, if you look at right these categories um, and how. Um, Minimal, um, the the and it's furious, and <laughs> if you want to take it to that level, these reasons that are given um, for stops and frisks is really startling, and that has a lot to do with Terry v. Ohio, U.S. Supreme Court decision that opened the door for a lessening of the um, the constitutional standard of the probable cause to allow for these so-called um, reasonable suspicion stops. And that has been uh, the pattern uh, nationally, and this, this actually uh, raises some, some very serious concerns about how that is affecting <coughs> African-American and Latino communities. Um, when we're looking at stops and frisks um, in Puerto Rican communities, we, uh, there, there is data on Hispanics that are being stopped. We know that that data is being kept. Um, that's kept by precinct by precinct. And what we have had to do then is go into uh, looking at the precincts, and these are the, the largely Puerto Rican, 17 precincts that are largely Puerto Rican, um, in Puerto Rican neighborhoods, from the Lower East Side to the Bronx to uh, Bushwick, uh, Brooklyn, etc. And uh, map, uh, match those with um, the data, uh, the precincts with the, the data uh, around the uh, Puerto Rican community so that we can get a better sense of how the Puerto Rican community is actually being affected by stops and push tactics in New York City. Um, and what we found is that neighborhoods that are predominantly, well, let, let me back up, of the 29 predominantly uh, Latino area codes, 17 were identified as Puerto Rican neighborhoods. Uh, and by what we, uh, in, in terms of how a, Puerto, how a neighborhood is identified as any particular logic of any particular group is a 30% or more 
of that particular group. Um, and neighborhoods that are predominantly Puerto Rican <coughs> account for 52%, 52.9% of all stops being made uh, in Latino uh, uh, zip codes. Um, and 25.45% uh, of all stops in New York City as a whole. That's pretty remarkable. So neighborhoods that are predominantly Puerto Rican, they account uh, <coughs> 29 point, uh, 20, uh, 20, sorry, 52.9% percent of all stops, uh, practically 53 percent of all stops being made in Latino communities. Uh, this is another way of showing that percentage. The percentage of total stops in New York, which is um, uh, uh, in red, and the percentage of total stops in New York City zip codes. Uh, these, the, what is in red is predominantly Latino compared to right, the percentage of total stops in New York City. Uh, the, the, uh, the difference is Dramatic. So when we look at uh, the data, the data is telling us that the average number of stops uh, for any uh, New York City um, precinct is around 7,646, right? 7,646. Of the 17 precincts responding uh, to predominantly Puerto Rican neighborhoods, what we find is 14%, or 14 precincts rather, have above 100% of the average stops per, per precinct. Five of these, uh, these precincts reported having an average of 151 uh, to 200 percent higher than the city, uh, a rate of, of stops higher than the city. Uh, six precincts report a number of uh, stops at 125 to 150 percent above the city mean. Uh, three precincts report a number of stops between 100 and 125 percent uh, above the average mean. The second tier is Cuban, Dominican, and Mexican, with 7 and 10% are self employed. And the third tier, Puerto Rican and Central American, with less than 6% uh, are, are actually self employed. Uh, and then I just graph the percentage by, by group and I can show you that the Puerto Rican yeah, is about 6%. Um, I go over some of the characteristics. Uh, um, and I want to finish by asking two questions. Do the self-employed people work more than everybody else and do they make more than everybody else? In other words, does it pay to be self-employed or are you just exploiting yourself for no, for no gain? <laughs> uh, 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 in terms of the question, do the self-employed work more, and these are the Latino. In terms of weeks work, then not, those that are not self-employed work on average 20 high weeks. Those that are self-employed work on average 37 weeks. Self-employed work more weeks and work more hours. So the issue of do they do they because if you in order to answer do they make more, you have to answer the question do they work more. So yes, they work more. Now the question is, given that, do they make more? Um, um, let me first do two other graphs. One which gives you the educational distribution of. Um, of the self-employed comparing total New York City for the Hispanic. And what you learn here is that the Hispanic uh, self-employed tend to be in the lower educational categories. The non-Hispanic self-employed tend to be in the higher educational categories. So for example, 19% uh, uh, of non-Hispanics uh, with a, a, a master's degree are self-employed, only 6% of Hispanics. So the Hispanic business owners <coughs> tend to have lower education than the non-Hispanic business owners. This is the distribution of the businesses by education. This is the distribution of the education of the business owners. So if you look at the New York City, again, 19% of folks in New York with a doctorate are self-employed. 13% of Puerto Ricans with a doctorate are self-employed. So with Puerto Ricans, just like with the other groups, the more education you have, the more likely you are to be self-employed. And that obtains for Puerto Ricans and for non-Puerto Ricans. But when you take a snapshot of our businesses, the typical non-Puerto Rican business is a consulting, engineering, or finance company. The typical Latino business is actually two types of businesses, one like that or a bodega. So in, in, in our business ownership distribution, it's like our income distribution. So when you look at Latino business owners, you're not just looking at the upper crust. You're looking at a part of the upper crust that works for themselves, and at a part of the population that's hustling. <laughs> uh, 
that, 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 that's trying to make it in self-employment. They're not, their salaries are not going way, way, way ahead of everybody else for that lower part of distribution where it is providing a stable uh, means of earnings. Just the last thing uh, that I'll show, the self-employed do make more money. The average Hispanic made 19,000. The average self-employed Hispanic made 25,000. For men, the average man made 23,000. The average self-employed man made 29,000. For women, the average wage-earning woman made 15,000. And look at the gender difference mm -hmm. alone. Uh, 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 and the average self-employed woman made uh, 23,000. So uh, uh, Latino business owners are not homogeneous, are heterogeneous, on average work more hours than those that don't own their businesses, but that additional work seems to be paying, both in terms of additional income for those that are in the upper crust, and in terms of stable income for those that are in the bottom uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the entrepreneurial uh, uh, labor market. And here I just basically graph what the difference looks like. Looks like. There are uh, a set of other conclusions uh, that in the interest of time, I think I'll kind of try to summarize them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hector. And our last speaker is uh, Ismael Garcia Colon from the College of Staten Island, who will actually be discussing a very interesting survey um, and providing us with a profile of Puerto Rican farm workers in the United States. Um, this presentation is a preliminary look at a survey uh, of Puerto Rican farm workers that Edwin Melendez and I conducted uh, uh, from June to November of this year. With the general support of the Ford Foundation mm -hmm. and Hector Cordero. Let me acknowledge that. By interviewing 200 workers, the study seeks to examine uh, the political economy of the U.S agricultural industry and its role in this uh, in, in, in this uh, in the employment of Puerto Rican in this industry, the opportunity for advancement within and, and outside the, the industry, the historical reasons for this migration, and relations between migrants and other workers, farmers, and residents of farm communities. The main goal of this study is to understand why Puerto Ricans continue to work in an industry characterized by low wages and intense competition from other seasonal and undocumented workers. And what can be done to improve the earning and opportunities for workers in this industry. So uh, let's take a trip uh, <laughs> to uh, Puerto Rican farm labor. Historically, most Puerto Ricans who work in agriculture migrate every year from Puerto Rico. The patterns of this seasonal migration began in post-war United States during the late 1940s. Uh, from 1947 through 1993, thousands of Puerto Rican workers migrated through the government of Puerto Rico's farm labor program. The current uh, Puerto Rican contract workers migrate as part of the H-2A visa program that requires employers to hire uh, workers before bringing foreign workers. Uh, however, the majority of Puerto Rican uh, work without contracts. Um, the American Community Survey uh, estimates uh, calculate the number of Puerto Rican workers in agriculture related activities in the United States as 5,000 and uh, 2,700 for the states that we examine. This reduced numbers explain why current Puerto Rican farm workers are forgotten from the contemporary uh, literature on Puerto Rican uh, migration and Latino workers. Uh, studies of U.S. farm labor concentrate on West Indian and Mexican workers, and they only survey their uh, sending communities. Contemporary studies about Puerto Rican migrants focus on the settlement and dynamics of large urban communities. Uh, in contrast, this uh, studies is about migration from, uh, basically from rural areas in Puerto Rico to the rural United States. The few studies on Puerto Rican farm workers deals with the history of this migration. Our approach is different because um, we, we are attempting to outline the aspect of this 20th century's 
phenomenon, phenomenon using survey methods. We also explore, or we are trying to explore whether Puerto Rican farm workers are examples of the flexibility that migration policies in a globalized economy can offer to regularize labor markets uh, effectively. In terms of uh, the methodology, uh, interviews were conducted with current uh, Puerto Rican farm workers, again from July to November uh, of this year, subjects were identified in the principal regions of Puerto Rican migrant farm labor, southern New Jersey, upstate New York, Connecticut, eastern Pennsylvania, and western Massachusetts. Using uh, ACS and uh, the USDA uh, census, we identified 26 counties in five states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts, with farms that employ uh, Puerto Rican workers. Community and advocacy organizations provided lists of farms identified to have Puerto Rican workers. These lists were combined, and uh, the counties were scouted uh, for other farms with Puerto Ricans. All the identified farms uh, were assigned a random number. Uh, the farms were ranked accor according to uh, the random uh, assignments. Then farms were classified as small, medium, and large account according to the number of workers. These sizes uh, at the same time were assigned a targeted number of farms where interviews were conducted. Uh, Basically, uh, we uh, were able to identify 70 farms with uh, Puerto Rican workers, uh, mostly uh, in southern New Jersey. And we identified 933 uh, Puerto Rican workers in uh, those uh, farms. Um, so, I mean, of the 26, 26 identified county, counties for Puerto Rican workers in five states, 12 had farms uh, selected for conducting the survey. We hired a total of 14 interviewers in these uh, regions. Uh, interviewers visited farms and uh, selected participants using a random number table. The instrument consisted of 61 questions divided in five parts about the personal background of the workers, migration history, employment histories, injuries and health, and uh, social uh, network and transnationalism. The survey design seeks to provide information of the, on the reasons for, for this contemporary migration flow, identify and survey workers who reside at state side and migrate to other states, and investigate their demographics, incomes, household, migration patterns, housing, health, and joint related uh, activity. Here, I'm just going to present as only a small descriptive part of the results uh, of the survey. Who are these workers? <clears throat> Most, uh, I mean, in terms of demographics, the ages of Farm workers range from 18 to 74 years old. Most workers tend to be in their 40s and 50s, with 41% uh, uh, 45 and older. 92% of them were born in Puerto Rico, and 7% uh, in the United States. Migrant workers residing in Puerto Rico represented 82% uh, of survey participants. I was wrong, <laughs> so now I have time. <laughs> uh, the, mar the marital status of workers was almost divided in, in, in the half between participants who are single, divorced, widowed, and, and separated, constituting 51%, and those married and living with a partner, uh, 48 percent of them. The educational level achieved by most workers is uh, junior high and high school, with most workers reporting some years of high school education, a high school diploma or GED. 
of all of them, 76% uh, report none or li little knowledge of a spoken English. Most workers younger than 35 years old have attained higher, uh, have higher educational levels. More, uh, however, most workers tend to be high school dropouts. You can see 58% uh, for those uh, ages of 18 to 24, uh, and uh, for those from the ages 25 to 34, 63 percent has uh, they have high school, uh, some years of high school. In general, in general, younger workers tend to speak less English because of their few years migrating, but at the same time, 16% 16 of them indicate substantial command of English, similar to workers of uh, 35 or years or older. In terms of um, our regarding the migration history, over 75% of the farm workers uh, from Puerto Rico have migrated fewer than 20 years, with half of all of farm workers migrating less than 10 years. They the ones that have uh, migrated in the last 10 years represent 34% of the, of the poll. The majority of first-time migrants in the last 10 years have less than uh, a high school education are more are more likely to be same. This characteristic can be appreciated in the in the following uh, tables. Recent migrants tend to have higher educational levels, though this table doesn't uh, fully illustrate that because uh, it's only from uh, the year 2000, uh, 2010, the recent the most uh, recent arrivals. Uh, but they, I mean, these are uh, the ones that tend to have uh, this uh, high school, at least uh, a, high, a high, high school degree. <clears throat> when, we look, when we look at their housing uh, while working uh, in the United States, the fact that 71% of participants living in a camp indicates that most of them are traditional season, seasonal migrant farm workers. Seasonal migrants tend to arrive between April and June and live between September and October. Um, in terms of uh, health care, 51% uh, of workers have some kind of health care uh, coverage and 42% lack any kind of coverage. Um, this situation is important because when I was interviewing them, uh, I have conducted open-ended interviews, and they have they they always uh, complain about the lack to access access uh, uh, healthcare uh, services. Their most common illnesses are high blood pressure, uh, high, uh, asthma, diabetes, arthritis, hernia cases, heart disease, depression, and kidney problems. In terms of uh, remittances. Um, we don't have uh, the, the we, we still need to clean the data, but we can say that uh, they report um, that the remittances are used for payments of debt uh, by food, clothing, housing, medical expenses, and education. Just to conclude, uh, you know, again, uh, we still need to, to analyze more uh, the survey. Uh, but we will, we will be able to uh, have the amount of remittances, the problems and abuse uh, confronted by workers in their employment sites and communities, their interest in obtaining training and services, and we will be able to identify their uh, sending communities for a future research project. And finally, we expect to recommend potential public policies and strategies of, for community intervention. Thank you. I uh, want to thank all the speakers because it looks like we have about 20 minutes.
to open it up and discuss. So I apologize for being so beginning, but I wanted to give them the opportunity to present and a large amount of time to facilitate questions related to any presentation. So at this point, I'd like to open the floor. I see. Will we, get, will we receive copies of these charts? They're very important. Yeah, I mean, I have them. I, I think the Centro has the first talk. I think we're going to post uh, some of the conference stuff uh, right now, and then there's a special issue of the, the journal mm -hmm. that's going to have the full papers. Right. Uh, but uh, you know, after the conference, you know, we need two or three months to revise the the, the work. But the, I think the Camacho uh, is here. Oh. Oh, we're going to upload all the powerpoints and uh, whatever papers were presented. Do you think you have this done by now? Well, uh, we can. We can easily send the, the, the PDF, uh, not the PDF file, but the PowerPoint. I printed mine as a, as a PDF, so uh, I think we can do that relatively quickly and, and just post it. Uh, but, uh, you know, your point, your point, a number of points, whatever. Yeah. Put it this way, Christmas is <laughs> Oh, by the way, we have a great Christmas party. You are always invited. <laughs> the 21st. Go ahead. Uh, this is for um, uh, Mimi. Um, um, I understand why you would want to um, focus on the direction of cause from neighborhood to stress to social problems. Um, but I think that um, it may be more complex. I mean, like statistically, we have um, what we call an economics of endogeneity going on. So it may be that, um, endogeneity. So it may be that, that yes, Neighborhood level affects stress, affects social problems, but social problems may affect neighborhood stress, and social problems may affect like neighborhood conditions too. For example, um, it may be that in high crime neighborhoods, um, that affects housing stock, it affects on housing prices and the bank housing. Um, so, so it may be that the causality, if there is causality, goes in both directions. You mean with this? Most studies do that. Or most studies that look at individuals alone, but, or look at it the way that you see the interaction. We purposely, and given that, we purposely want to see if we can pull out. I mean, doing, it's going against the grain in a lot of the research, I really, but given what you said. We really want to see if we can pull out what the infrastructure impact is, knowing that there could be a bounce back. But it's, it's when it's done, either the bounce back or just behavior to problems. Um, the infrastructure gets lost. So this really is an attempt to highlight that. So, but I guess what I'm saying is that, like st statistically, if you um, if you just focus on one direction, then the effect of the one direction may be biased. Yeah, it might be. but so is the, all the research that we're trying to correct for the bias that exists in the existing research, which doesn't doesn't look at, doesn't bring this up. So yes, we have to deal with that. But. That was the Maybe just, just as a suggestion to your geographer, there's a whole battery of tests that are called local indicators of statistical autocorrelation, which essentially deal with that problem you're, you're mentioning, is, which is to, you know, it looks at calls and hot spots of correlation, but it also disentangles whether the correlation is a result of that concentration or of the result of randomness as a, as a function of proximity to other hot and cold spots. So that's a very useful tool to, to disentangle the spatial relationship with the vectors of, of variables in the index. You have to change the nature of the indexes, however. Yeah. I'd love to Te tell your, your, your geographer. Well, he may know this. I, don't, I can't yeah. speak to it. I have a question for Hector and one for uh, Mike. Uh, Hector, do you have any idea where does the capital comes from for the Latino and Puerto Rican firms? Family, their own capital, their business, loans, whatever? Yeah, the, the census doesn't ask what is the source of uh, funding for the business. It's just basically asking somebody, where do you work and if you work for yourself. And the survey of minority or business enterprise, I think the details of it do ask to what extent there's capital composition. So I'll have to endeavor to look at that. I didn't really go over a lot of theory, but if, if one really wants to think one's teeth into this question, one has to answer three questions. One is a question about money. Where do the resources come from for these businesses? Two is the question of the kind of human capital and the management, which I addressed a little bit. And the third is a question of the specific markets and industries where these businesses are concentrated. So in order for us to fully understand 
the chances that these businesses have of succeeding or not. One has to understand kind of what is their access to what Tim Bates called the three M's, right? Where the money, where they get the resources, the capital to get the operation funded, is it adequately funded? Uh, second is the management, and is there adequate management and human capital uh, assets to manage the business? And the third is the understanding of which markets are they operating in, and are they in captured markets, the Arroz of Juelas market, which is very different from trying to compete in the, say, healthcare market, which is a lot more. And we benefit from some of those niches, but the success of a lot of the entrepreneurs when I looked at the industries was in fact in the fact that they were across industries. As a community, we benefit from getting our businesses to grow on the niches, but over the long term, that may end up over-concentrating and being counterproductive. So we're better off when most of our businesses begin to diversify and look like the other businesses. Uh, question for uh, Ignacio. You said that most migrant workers from Rico come here from April to September. Do you have any idea what they do when they are in Puerto Rico? Are they employed, unemployed? Uh, they usually get they get unemployment in Puerto Rico. and they work in like doing Chibi chivitos. Uh, uh, they, they have land. They have access to land. Uh, some of them have access to land, uh, and um, you know, uh, but most they do this kind of work. What this is my opinion is because they work seven days a week uh, when they are here. Uh, more than 70 hours a week and you know they save money because they most of them work live in the camps they don't have to pay rent and they go back to Puerto Rico to use that money and to collect unemployment plus any kind of you know, job on the side that they can find. So, some of them reports working 7.7 .7 days. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I also have a question for maybe a couple of minutes. Uh, and, and I couldn't, and I, and I understand and appreciate that you are doing this on your time as opposed to the uh, grants. But I couldn't help uh, uh, but think that if you're doing a comparison, and, and we saw how the stress of cities are you know, off the charts, uh, and you're also looking at the Upper West Side as a comparison group. It would be wonderful to perhaps do uh, a temporal analysis as well, you know, because the Upper West Side, particularly the 80s around Columbus and Amsterdam, north, northward, uptown, was mostly a Puerto Rican neighborhood back in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, so, you know, that's another way in which the neighborhood changed. You know, it went, it changed uh, demographically, uh, even though geography remained the same. It was, it's no longer a Puerto Rican Hispanic neighborhood uh, as it was 20, 30 years ago. So I, I think that uh, uh, some of those issues of uh, endogeneity that you were talking about might be reflected in a, in a comparison with uh, data from 30 years ago. Right, but the stress data we're collecting today, we actually took surveys into the streets. And I see. That, that, that data doesn't exist <coughs> Correct. anywhere. So we, that's the, the, the other two variables we can collect. But, but your point is well taken because East Harlem, first of all, we want to do the whole city. If right, we yes. get money, we would try to do that survey much further. Uh, but also, uh, East Harlem is undergoing a tremendous change also. So and that's just a chronic problem <coughs> in New York City if you're trying to study neighborhoods and the data is five years old, ten years old. Now the census data is completely changed. They don't have it by zip, they have it by different neighborhoods and the prior census data. So you can, you know, make sure you know, okay, so. <laughs> um, it's yeah. not in, in, in the 50s and 60s, there's the enormous energy and intellect being led by some of the major universities. Columbia School, Richard Cloud, they had Solon Institute. There was a movement in the country. And it was being led really by schools of social work, community organizations. The agency that we worked for, under the leadership of Dr. Antonia Manto. Speaks to, it's echoing. A lot of people are saying, we're seeing the same thing. And that's that it'll have different flavors, if you would. But basically, it's the same. But no, to answer your question, I don't have self accounting. Just to follow up on this, have, has, there been, has this been addressed by public health officials, especially these? I mean, that's one avenue of, of addressing, addressing this. Yeah. Has anyone from public health right. addressed these homes? People from public health in Puerto Rico know this. How about, how about we can't here? count in Puerto Rico. I'll, I'll yeah. go to that. The New York City Department of Health knows about this, the New York State Department of Health knows about this. Are they reacting to it in many ways? No, they're not. Actually, they're, it's a very complex issue, but no, to answer your question, no, they're not reacting to it. And I said, I'm the Chief Deputy Commissioner of Health of Pacific County. I'm the first Hispanic. 
And when I see hear things like this, it really gets me riled up because Good. I would work with the DA, with the my law school, and also with the county attorney and get right on it. I can, I can tell you a little story. Things. The DA in the Bronx was brought into this. They brought the FBI. They interviewed one guy and let it go. That, that's uh, well, right. It's, it's you, you see the frustration that yes. I'm also dealing with. Good afternoon, everyone. Buenas tardes. We're going to continue now with the plenary discussion. We're going to continue now with the plenary uh, discussion. Our panelists are Victoria Nunez from. Uh, Brooklyn College, Juan Cartagena Community Service Society, Iris Avala Martinez from Center for Puerto Rican Studies, and uh, Ann Visser from Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Uh, we'll be covering summaries. They will each be uh, covering a summary of each of the panels. Obviously, they ran concurrently this morning, so you weren't able to attend all of them simultaneously. So what we will have then is a, a small summary, a brief summary of each of the panels, and uh, our uh, discussants will actually comment as well uh, on, on the salient points that they think uh, came out of this, this morning's discussion. Uh, we will first start with Victoria Nunez from uh, Brooklyn College. Before she, she, uh, she begins, though, I do want to make, make uh, one mention. We have a group that has joined us all the way from Chicago, uh, Pedro Alviso Campos, Puerto High School. So I want to thank you for coming here. Students, uh, student Affairs has been here, and so I want to welcome them. Hi, everyone. I want to also welcome the group of public school educators, students, and community-based organizations that have traveled from Chicago to our wonderful city. They're doing what sounds like a wonderful educational tour of the city. And also welcome, again, all of you who um, live in the city and surrounding areas and are here to join in this very important conversation. In the education panel entitled Strengthening the Educational Pipeline, Dr. Luis Reyes began uh, by talking about a number of the challenges facing Puerto Rican students in New York City public schools. Challenges like overcrowded schools, unresponsive administrators, and he did talk about uh, some social struggles that are happening every day in schools, including yesterday. Um, and he also briefly mentioned the need for better access to center-based early childhood education, um, which is particularly important in communities where there are large numbers of low socioeconomic status, um, people living at low socioeconomic status, such as in the Puerto Rican community. His comments really focused more on public schools and K-12 schooling, although certainly um, Professor Mercado's uh, presentation did lead us into some discussion of post-secondary schooling as well. Uh, in terms of some demographic information that Professor Reyes uh, or, or Dr. Reyes presented, he uh, discussed some information from the 2007 American Community Service uh, Survey of the U.S. Census, um, which um, tells us that one third of Puerto Rican adults in New York City do not have a high school diploma. More than two thirds have no college education. Um, which leaves about 30% of Puerto Ricans in New York City who have a degree of higher education, either an associate's degree, a BA, an MA, or a PhD. So that's a little bit about the profile of um, Latino Puerto Rican education in the city of New York that he presented. Um, and what he noted in terms of the kinds of graduation rates that are produced both in the city of New York and in the state of
state of New York is that the numbers are not disaggregated for Latino groups. So we have Latino rates for graduation, but we don't know what is the graduation rate of Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, and Mexicans, and people from other Latin American origin groups. Um, and he felt like this was an important point as we address the educational crisis uh, facing Puerto Rican and other Latino students. Well, we don't know exact graduation rates. Um, we do know some general information about um, what's going on with the schools today, and certainly Dr. Reyes's presentation addressed some of the concerns. So for instance, um, New York City is proposing to close a good number of high schools for poor performance, and that a number of those schools, close to half of them in fact, um, have very large, if not dominant, uh, Latino populations of students. And um, very frequently, the new schools that are opening at the secondary level follow a model of of small schools and small school education, which is a good model, I think, but unfortunately, when reproduced in a mass scale as is being done now in New York City and at a frequent, at a very high um, speed, they're opening these schools, these new schools don't necessarily address the needs uh, for culturally responsive pedagogy, culturally responsive curriculum. Um, or the needs of English language learning students. So this was a concern that uh, Dr. Reyes brought up. In terms of um, Professor Mercado's paper, she talked about the 70-year project that Puerto Ricans have been engaged in in searching for quality teachers for Puerto Ricans here in New York City. So she didn't dwell much on the early history, but certainly since the 1940s, there has been um, discussion going on in New York City, in the Department of Education, and among Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rican educators um, about how do we develop the Puerto Rican educators that Puerto Rican students need. <laughs> Professor Mercado addressed a number of challenges that face Puerto Rican students today, um, as well as opportunities and strategies. And I think that she, together with other Centro staff, have been working on a particularly interesting idea of thinking about putting together education and workforce development. And how can we introduce the teaching professions to more Puerto Rican young people. So she spoke both about the population that is highlighted in the report, the disconnect, the population of disconnected young adults, uh, Puerto Rican, between ages of 16 and 24, and is there are there ways to introduce the variety of teaching professions, so not only being a teacher, but also being a paraprofessional, different kinds of other uh, allied professionals that work in schools, as well as school leaders, um, introducing those professions to Puerto Rican young adults and using this as a potential incentive to help provide motivation and focus for young people to go back to school and to go to college and to get the credentials in order to be able to teach. She also talked about the fact that the Puerto Rican community is very much, in terms of income, a bifurcated community in that there is a large percentage living at very low income but then there's also um, a not so large percentage that has achieved middle class status, people who have worked in white collar occupations who may have faced layoffs in the recent economy and may also be more interested um, in considering the great benefits of working in the field of education. Um, so certainly Professor Mercado was concerned that um, in terms of doing outreach for the 
teaching professions, the efforts that get the most attention um, are Teach for America nationally. And in New York City, the New York City Teaching Fellows tends to be one of the better funded programs that gets um, a fair amount of attention. And that it's important um, for there to be a message that goes out to Puerto Ricans and other Latinos that these are good jobs and they can offer many benefits. So that was certainly one point that Professor Mercado made in terms of the opportunities. The second opportunity she certainly focused on had to do with the use of Spanish and developing um, the bilingual skills of Puerto Rican and other Latino students who may have been born in the United States, may have been born outside of the United States, but she noted that Spanish is increasingly um, only increases to be a language of importance in the United States. Clearly, um, some very well-known political figures have uh, begun working to communicate in Spanish with Latino communities. So to build on the importance of Spanish in terms of developing bilingual, bicultural, and biliterate educators, as well as educational programs that value that and help students to develop that. So certainly, both presenters were concerned and interested in um, the notion of growing our own teachers for the future as a strategy to improve uh, education for Puerto Rican students. And in terms of my uh, comments and responses, um, I think that there were a few points. I had received these papers ahead of time, so there were a few points that our presenters were not able to get to, but that came through in reading their papers. And one had to do um, with a focus on how do we improve Puerto Rican academic achievement within the schools? And how do we know if things are improving or not improving? So, um, a number of researchers, including Dr. Reyes, has pointed out that it's important to know uh, which are the secondary schools, as well as school districts here in New York City, which are having the least success at graduating Latino students in New York City. Um, so it's not only Dr. Reyes who had that in his paper, but other researchers who have stated that as a priority, that we need to know what are the problem districts and what are the problem schools. Um, and that information is not necessarily being compiled. And and I'm not necessarily going to suggest that this is Centro's job to do this, but I do think um, for a policy agenda for Centro that it would be worthwhile to think with partners who should do that task, who should work on that task. Another point has to do, which uh, neither of the papers actually addressed, is that um, Latino four-year graduation rates in the city of New York and in the state of New York as well have gone up over uh, the period from 2005 to 2009. So I'll use statewide figures. In 2005, 42% of Latino students were graduating. In 2009, 55% of Latino students were graduating from high school. So this is an increase of 13% over four years, which is a significant can increase. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge improvements at the same time that we continue to express concern about these very low rates of high school completion. Um, finally, I guess I just want to add that I think when I feel like I've been reading the educational research that Centro has been producing over the last 20 years, so I think I've read almost all of it. Um, and it's not that much, but there's certainly good reports and good policy briefs and good academic research articles um, that have come out of that research. And what stands out in the current environment is that 
Centro is a small organization and it can rarely have more than one full-time staff person working on educational issues, whether that person is called an educational researcher, an educational associate, it's rare that it has been more than one person. And this is a really big task. And so I do think it is incumbent upon Centro as a small organization to work in collaboration with some other key partners in terms of advancing its policy goals. Um, in the era of No Child Left Behind, and I believe that that law is reaching its 10-year anniversary, um, there is a blizzard of quantitative data that has been developed on achievement gaps, um, graduation rates, performance of English language learners. Beyond No Child Left Behind, the campaign for fiscal equity brought to a close a successful lawsuit at the state level, which has brought in many new funds to New York City. Where is that money going? And is that money making a difference for Puerto Rican and other Latino students? So the campaign for fiscal equity is watching and paying attention to what's happening with those funds. But certainly, one of the strategies that Dr. Reyes mentioned was a need to increase flexible funding to schools so that there can be more learning time for students who are struggling with academic achievement. So certainly one source of that funding, I mean the major source has to be public funds because it's so much that's needed and we need to know what's going on with that money. And um, so those are my suggestions and that's a little bit of our conversation. Um, at the end of this panel, we will have a little time for questions and discussion. So we will hear from the panelists first, and they will summarize the, the uh, discussions this morning in the different panels. And our next panelist is Juan Cartagena, Community Service Society, will discuss the criminal justice panel. Buenas tardes. How's everybody back there? Me oyen? Just make sure you're awake. <laughs> um, I am very, very privileged to have been sitting in a panel discussion on the fairness of the criminal justice system at a Puerto Rican conference <laughs> anywhere in this world. Anywhere. It, takes, it took a long, long time for people who have been looking at the issues of criminal justice and the aftermath and the consequences of criminal justice of Puerto Ricanos to finally get a little piece of discussion among all the issues that Puerto Ricanos and Puerto Ricanas face in this country uh, to finally start talking about criminal justice. Just tiempo. There is nobody in the Zoom, I bet you. You don't have to raise your hand. That has not been directly affected by the criminal justice system, or that either has had a loved one, a spouse, a brother, sister, aunt, or uncle that has not been picked up by the police and brought into the criminal justice system, including many of us in this room ourselves. The criminal justice explosion, the entire mass incarceration explosion in the United States has ensnared everyone. The days in which we can have moral judgments about our neighbors and our family members who get caught up in the criminal justice system are over. It's too pervasive. It's too pervasive. We're all caught up in it. And it's time that we start addressing the consequences of criminal justice fallout. Because at core, at the core, <clears throat> New York State is no different than New Jersey or Connecticut or Florida or Illinois and Chicago because it produces, the criminal justice systems produce racially skewed outcomes. Criminal justice courts produce racially skewed outcomes because decisions about who to stop, who to question, who to arrest, who to prosecute, who to set bail for, who to find guilty, who gets sentenced to prison as opposed to probation? Who gets lengthier terms of parole versus shorter terms of parole? All are racially determined. There are clear 
kind of uh, uh, correlations between all those points of reference, points of contact between law enforcement, district attorney's offices, and judges, and Latinos, Puerto Ricanos, African Americans, in fact, virtually every poor person in the United States. And it's time. So I was very happy to hear both Jose Luis Morin and Brian Montes issue a report called Puerto Rican Youth in the Criminal Justice System. They talk about how uh, Latinos are the fastest growing group in, in incarceration in the United States. That uh, Latinas, for example, also are very, very uh, uh, inc increased in very large numbers in the United States. They have a rate of incarceration twice the size, twice, two times that of white women in the United States. 117 per 100,000 versus 63. They talk about how Latinos in general are stopped uh, in many ways by uh, law enforcement in ways that far exceed their proportion of the population, and this is important, and their involvement in criminal activity. Because even when you control for crime, Latinos and Puerto Ricans in New York City get stopped and frisked more than anybody else on these cohorts. One one point that they raise, they raise, and we've been talking about the kind of research that I've been doing for a while, is the engine, the biggest engine of mass incarceration in the United States is not the problem of violent crime, it's not the problem of property crime, it's the so-called war on drugs. And the so-called war on drugs is actually a war against really poor people who use drugs. It's really a war against people of color who use drugs, because the war is determined in advance. The data that Jose, Luis, and Brian point out in their paper demonstrates that whites in this country use drugs at higher rates than Latinos and Puerto Ricans, that whites in this country sell drugs at higher rates than Latinos and Puerto Ricans in this country, but that Latinos and Puerto Ricans in the country get busted for it. Real shorthand, I guess. And one of the things that happens when Latinos get busted for it at high numbers is the skewed racial results that I told you before in the criminal justice system. But one of the things the paper does not do, and I would love eventually to have a discussion at Central and elsewhere about it, is an honest debate about the premise of the war on drugs. When can we have an honest debate about drug legalization in this country? When can we have an honest debate about how crazy is a domestic policy that pumps in billions of dollars in interdiction in law enforcement and creates this incredible motivation economically that takes a substance that costs $500 in a source country and can be sold for $500,000 on the streets of New York and we think we can stop this? Nothing stops that motivation. There's money to be made in illegal drugs. Nothing will stop that motivation. The last time I mentioned the war on drugs and the possibility of legalizing drugs as a source of solutions for some of the problems in Latino communities, I was, right after I spoke, I went outside to make a phone call in some outdoor patio, I think it was in Queens College, in the local. And the professor came up to me, she goes, she whispers to me, you're not using drugs, are you? You're not using drugs, are you? No, carajo. <laughs> I didn't smoke a bone before I walked into this room. I'm not doing drugs. Just because I want to have a discussion about drug legalization doesn't mean I'm doing drugs. So we need to have a discussion eventually about what is the space in this, in this domestic policy of, of drug, uh, drugs in general and what they all mean. We have allowed the criminal justice system to take a health issue, a decision that should be between you and your doctor, and made it a criminal justice issue. And this is the consequences that we have today. So in some ways, this report advances a lot of those issues. It talks about how when you control for crime, as I mentioned before, uh, whites are more likely to commit crime but not get busted for it. It talks about how uh, uh, whites are often the perpetrators of white victims of crime, but yet those figures are not borne out by the data on arrests. Um, it talks about gang activity and how actually the largest number of gang members in the United States are white folk. But you wouldn't know that based on the literature. You wouldn't know that definitely based on what you see on TV. In fact, it counter, it's counterintuitive. Everything we've been taught, from the images of dark-looking people in handcuffs on America's Most Wanted to the crap that they sell you on Fox News, continues to reinforce the promise, the premise that blacks and Latinos are the biggest scourge, that black people, brown people, people of color are the ones we have to be worried about. When crime, violent crime, Nonviolent crime, 
property crime, drug crime, is committed more by white folk in this country than anybody else. And I mean more proportionally as well. So in some ways, the other things that this paper does incredibly does so, it talks about also the school policies. Did you know that the law enforcement population, the law enforcement, the, de the deployment of law enforcement personnel in New York City public schools is the fifth largest police force in the country. Larger than police force of Washington, D.C., Las Vegas, Phoenix, y un montón de otras ciudades that I can't remember. That's how much it, we have permeated this issue of law enforcement that is in our schools. And we allow school enforcement at the public school level to criminalize behavior what was once between us when we were kids, just regular old behavior among kids. So a fight in the street or a fight in the hallway becomes criminalized. In many ways, this mirrors what a lot of what's been happening in the criminal justice system for juvenile justice and juvenile defend offenders here in New York City as well, in New York State. Because I work quite a bit um, and seen a lot of the data that comes out of the Office of Children and Family Services and the incredible work that Gladys Cateo has done as commissioner of that office to reduce, yes, give her hand, to reduce. To reduce, to reduce our dependence on juvenile residential facilities, to close down the ones that are not being used, and to start looking for alternatives to residential placement for, ju placement for juveniles. Well, the data that Jose talks about at the school level is mirrored in the juvenile justice system today. Did you know that half, over half of the juveniles that are placed in residential facilities for crimes, those crimes are misdemeanors. And yet they'll serve over a year and a half, sometimes two, sometimes two and a half years in a juvenile facility for a misdemeanor that under normal circumstances will not result in more than a year in, crime, in incarceration. The incredible evidence then, then talks about the uh, highlights of this paper, then goes into an area of stop and frisk. And Brian Montes and Jose Luis Morin tried to create a model of looking at the demographic of, demographic of zip codes, superposing that data and that demographic on the stop and frisks of New York City. Stop and frisk data is amazingly rich. That's because New York City Police Department conducts a lot of stops and frisks. <laughs> it's rich data. 570,000 people were stopped alone. 570,000 in 2009 alone. What they determined is that just looking at the zip code demographic as a proxy, that 25% of all stops are made in Puerto Rican neighborhoods, but Puerto Ricans only uh, equate to about 10% of the New York City population. So more stops are being made in Puerto Rican neighborhoods than not. The fact that stops don't result in much, it's not, law, it's not effective law enforcement. <laughs> is preventive, blunderbuss, shotgun, terroristic law enforcement. That's what it really is. <laughs> because the, the number of people who actually get arrested after, stop, after 570,000 stop and frisks is minuscule. By the way, the number of guns that are recovered in 570,000 stops and frisks in New York City is really minuscule. It gets dwarfed by just one weekend of gun amnesty programs in any one of our neighborhoods. You can put more guns off the street than sit in New York by having one weekend of give me your gun, I'll give you $20, or I'll give you $100 for a gun, no questions asked, than you can with 570,000 stops and frisks. That's the price we're supposed to pay for the alleged equation between reduction of violent crime and stop and frisk data. There is no correlation between the reduction of violent crime and stop and frisks. There has been nobody who's printed any kind of journal, any kind of peer-reviewed journal or publication that has made that observation because they can't prove it. So incredibly, this paper does all of that and more. And it talks about interesting issues regarding um, police activity, Puerto Rican neighborhoods, and the issue for youth. In many ways, the, the paper then sets up a discussion for the next paper. And the next paper is actually was done by uh, Jenny Rivera and Jody Vore, uh, out of uh, It's called Puerto Ricans in the Legal Profession. Um, I believe that in many ways these connect, these were very connected papers in some many 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 ways. Uh, we have 
We have a larger problem in terms of criminal justice policies, and that's because the largest problem is that being tough on crime sells. Being tough on crime gets votes. Being deemed as soft on crime is political suicide. We can have this conversation amongst ourselves, but if I had a conversation with each one of you and you were all elected official, by now you would have tuned me out. They said, people local. I can do crazy if he thinks I'm going to vote to lessen mandatory sentences. If he thinks I'm going to vote to get rid of three strike rules. If he thinks I'm going to vote to reduce the sentences of people who, uh, who possess drugs. He must be crazy. I'll get killed at home. My voters will never support that. And that's the biggest problem. We too often times govern through crime in urban areas. And the result now is, what is it about, this? what are the solutions could it very well be that we should need to increase the number of Puerto Ricanos and Puerto Ricanas in the legal profession? Well, that in many ways is, the, is what's being posited by this paper by Jenny and Jody. Only 3.4% of U.S. attorneys are Latino. And they talk about a number of issues as well. They talk about how college completion rates in general are very tough for Puerto Ricans. And as a result, you have a less of a, a, a Puerto Ricans who are joining the pipeline to finally get out as attorneys and graduated from law school. They do mention how Puerto Ricans attend probably the most segregated uh, school, uh, schools in the country, segregated by race. So their body of networks, their social networks are developed at a very early stage and are limited because they're going to schools where mostly only Puerto Ricans and other Latinos attend. They talk about issues regarding mentoring and preparing for a law school application process. Mentoring, personal statement review, uh, law student uh, aptitude test LSAT review. One of the things I would suggest for this particular paper is to try to rely upon all the data that's been developed at the Puerto Rican Legal Defense Fund, now called the Latino Justice Prodef, that has an education division that's been in existence since the 1970s. I called them up the other day just to double check that they're still collecting data, and they are. They collect data on everybody who goes to their workshops, national origin data. So we can finally trace a pool of people that every year go to their offices for assistance in the law school application process, and we can try to trace to see how many Puerto Ricans have taken advantage of those opportunities and what the results are for them. The paper then talks about uh, the difficulty in the admission process, and the biggest difficulty, which I think the paper should probably highlight more, is the LSAT score itself. The legal profession is notoriously elitist. It actually believes that an LSAT score is the most important thing to determine whether or not you get into law school. The LSAT score has never been correlated with success in law school. It's only been correlated positively to success in the first year of law school. It says very little about whether you'll finish it. It says very little about whether you'll pass the bar. So in many ways, we have to attack frontally this notion that the LSAT score should be the primary dominant factor in solution. And finally, well, two things. The, the paper actually says, very interestingly enough, that in New York, all law professors happen to be Puerto Rican. And that, according to the paper, all law professors are female Puerto Ricans in New York State. Up until today when I met this gentleman right here, Daniel Serrano, who is starting to teach law already at St. John's Law School. But the fact of the matter is, there's a very small number of law professors who are Puerto Rican uh, throughout the state of New York, where you would think otherwise, given the numbers that we have here. Um, I'll end with just two more observations about this particular paper. Um, well, three. We need to also identify what is the role of the specialty bars in the, in the country for Puerto Rican advancement through law school. In every one of our states, we have some form of a Latino Hispanic Bar Association. What is their role in increasing the number of Puerto Ricans who apply, get admitted, exit, and pass the bar? Uh, we need to definitely focus on that. Secondly, this paper unfortunately doesn't say a word about affirmative action. And it needs to. There is no solution. There cannot be a comprehensive solution to the issue of how many, lawyer, how many Puerto Ricans get into law school, graduate school, without a full discussion about affirmative action and its incredible benefits to the population that we're trying to serve. And lastly, um, I deal with this when voting rights issues, when I do quite a number of issues on voting rights, and that is there's a, there's a tension in the United States between what we call, in voting rights law, descriptive representation and substantive representation. The script is, the script is, if, is when you elect people of your, who are your national origin to become your elected officials. Substantive is you elect people of any race 
because they're good on the substance. Right? Well, I think the same discussion should be had for Puerto Rican lawyers. Is it necessary for us to have more Puerto Rican lawyers so those Puerto Rican lawyers could do well individually in their homes? Is the only purpose of a bar association is to increase the number of Puerto Rican lawyers to become Puerto Rican judges? Is that all we're talking about here? No. If Puerto Rican lawyers are not prepared to deal with the issues that are confronting this conference and confront you every day, pa' qué? Pa' qué? So in some ways, we have to ask the question that we increase Puerto Rican lawyers because we know and have faith and eventually have commitment and have proof that they will make a difference. Otherwise, we just have a bunch of Puerto Rican lawyers. <laughs> My panel, the panel that I was moderating, had four papers. I will try to be briefer on those four papers because they were very good, well thought out, well written, well presented, exciting papers. And I hopefully I'm going to then make some suggestions and and, um, and in Baton's word, Gregory Baton's word, see the pattern that connects. Dr. Burgos, who's a professor at McGill in Canada, presents the, a very interesting and sophisticated analysis that examines how socioeconomic status mediates the effects of residential racial segregation on the health of Puerto Ricans. Focusing on disability, which is defined as a, func a lack of, of adequate functioning, either in sensory, emotional, physical, or mental areas. This was so because given the studies that have been done on Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans tend to be highly segregated from non-Hispanics. And the studies, there's a link in the literature that, there's a, that economic disadvantage and poor health are related. But these studies have not been done on Puerto Rican populations. So his work in many ways is seminal. Further, as you've read, heard this morning, health studies on Puerto Ricans indicate immense amount of poor issues for health, overweight, diabetes, asthma, hypertension, más de todo. But we want más de lo bueno todo, you know? Más de lo malo, we want más de lo bueno. And what he found in the relationship between residential, racial residential segregation and health was the following. 15% of the Puerto Ricans report disability higher than the natural average, which is 12.5, um, and comparable to the general Latino population, which is 13. Younger, lower in younger uh, persons, in males, unmarried, U.S. born, and in higher SES. Those are not surprising findings. Puerto Ricans with disabilities tend to live in counties, and this is a study, by the way, I kind of jumped only because I want to go faster. He looked at 78 counties, so he really looked at immense amount of data. Puerto Ricans with disabilities tend to live in counties more isolated from non-Hispanic whites with higher concentrations of Puerto Ricans, more urbanized, with higher levels of concentrated disadvantage, economic disadvantage, and with more heterogeneity. Higher levels of Puerto Rican positive have a positive effect on SES. The conclusions, some of this apart from these, is that segregation course negatively affects the health of Puerto Rican and concentrates this on economic disadvantage. Further, social economic status is definitely an intervening variable between isolation and disability. More isolated the community, more racially, residentially stratified, segregated the community, more disability. That should not surprise us though, because if together there is a better chance of being more healthy, more isolated the Puerto Rican community, more the disability. Puerto Ricans living in, 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 in communities with higher levels of education or of, of 
Isolation also tend to have lower income. He explained that this was an exploratory study, but still, he, this was, I'm sorry, not an exploratory study, this was a study that he's still looking at different aspects, but it's a seminal study because this has not been looked at, this area of the relationship of disability and health in, as uh, related to racial residential segregation. So we were really interested because then we found that in the later studies, I think he was interested in that, the data that two other studies brought confirmed what he was saying of his empirical studies. So let's move on to those two other studies. Dr. Blanca Ramos, a Peruvian, and I say she's Boricuanizada, who has done various uh, studies on Puerto Rican community, did an exploratory study, a uh, sample of 153 women, women in upper state New York, in Albany, and an area I, uh, somebody called while I was having lunch, a Mary, a Mary Stram, how do you call that city? Amsterdam. Amsterdam, but it's called a Mary Rican. Some people give it, try to give it that type of flavor. Okay. <laughs> this was a community apparently that was at one time had a lot of uh, factories and had labor and there was a lot of uh, work for the Puerto Rican community. This is in the Albany area. She looked at stress, coping, and mental health among rural Puerto Rican women in upstate New York and tried to examine precisely how stress and mental health relate and what are the coping strategies that Puerto Rican women look. She looked at various factors, age, gender, place of birth, uh, time in the United States, and related this to the main coping and stress paradigms that are good paradigms, but we need to use them more in ethnic groups to really see how useful those paradigms are for us, because they're not based on renewed or revisited ethnic concepts. What did she find? Well, she found that 72% of the Puerto Ricans born in the, in, 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 that were born in Puerto Rico were, had higher stress. They had low SES, 50% had less of a 13,000, almost 14,000 income, 65.3% expressed distress. They distressed about not having enough money, they lacked English skills, they did not have transportation, feeling discriminated, things that we would, that really the literature supports in many ways. Feeling disempowered, women who feel that they don't have equal opportunities with the Anglos, that they have low paying jobs, that who express, who have manifestations, diagnostic manifestations of anxiety, depression, ataque de nervios, who also had issues, some with family conflicts, that created a tremendous amount of stress, and women who were low acculturated. With the notion of low acculturated, I wonder somehow if we could turn it around. Instead of saying low acculturated, what would it be the opposite? If you are low acculturated or higher acculturated, if you're low acculturated, maybe you are more nationally ethnic, okay? You know, this will, I just want to throw out esa pista because at the end I'm going to talk about some language uses in trying to refocus ourselves and in keeping with the human rights um, message today. Um, she did find that coping, Puerto Rican culture has a lot of healthy coping mechanisms. Familialism is protective. Not all the time, but it is protective to many families. The church, amazing, she narrated some um, groups that she had with his church and the, the, the support that the church gives to women. Uh, the use of food, um, the importance of the social support. Nevertheless, there were women, a high group of women, who felt lonely, who felt um, dissociated. And in that sense, she also talked of something that the next study brings up, which is curious, the loss or ambivalence about the island, about where's home. So this study confirmed also that 
the these were women who were to pick up on the first study racially segregated in an area different and distant from the white community. Even though it didn't focus on disability per se, it did look at an aspect of mental health which takes aspects of disability, not that they've been identified, but that relates to high stress, high anxiety, depression. So in that way, this study confirmed the first study notion that more isolation from the broader community, low SES had impact on mental health and on coping. The third study by Yara Blanco, uh, Yara Blanco and her did something very interesting. She came with her clinical team. She's the clinical work team all came, so all four presented, which was quite interesting, quite exciting. They did an excellent job. It was a biopsychosocial profile of the Puerto Rican clients seeking services a clinician's view. We found here too that in New Haven she discussed the race racial segregation of the Puerto Rican community in a part of New Haven, uh, on the south part it seemed like to be, which was I'm interesting to be confirmed that the thesis of racial segregation and its impact on health. Her results indicated that most of the women were between 45, the sample was 98 women, that most of the women were between 45 and 49, so you have an older group, separated or divorced, average of three children, lived in the United States for more than 11 years, were basically Catholic. The women in, in uh, Albany were more Pentecostal. Here, they were Catholic. They had completed high school. They were unemployed, but they did pass factory work. They had almost the same annual income as a woman in Albany, $14,000. Um, they lived on state insurance and suffered very similar diagnostic um, problems, major depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and secondary problems, substance abuse. They had very similar medical problems to the, the group of the racial, the residential racial segregation, high asthma, high diabetes, uh, high hypertension, and they also had the similar experience of circular migration. If things would get difficult, they are an economic posi position open in Puerto Rico for some reason, they would go to Puerto Rico and they would come back to the United States. But this at the same time creates an emotional vibing, as we know, back and forth, which is unstable. But at the same time, this group of women felt that the United States was not their home, though they've been here a while, that their home is a cultural identity, it's an affective fixation, and that Puerto Rico was that ambivalent home that comes and go. But that ambivalent sense is something I want to pick up, that home that floats, that home that is a loss, I will pick up in a, in a while, because it relates to a thesis of cultural homelessness, of some some sort of trauma, some sort of experience that I think our Puerto Rican community is experiencing in general. I, I thought this study was, uh, it was interesting because I didn't plan, I didn't realize, you know, I had read them, but I didn't realize that they were going to really relate to each other and they fed each other in incredible ways that really we did not plan. They made a tremendous amount of recommendations at the macro level, very specific recommendations like changes in SSI, changes in the therapeutic system, changes in, um, there was one big one there about um, uh, the need for monolingual and bilingual therapists. I was so impressed by that because I left the States many, many years ago, and those were the same recommendations we were making, and we talked about that, and they're still the same needs. They need more therapists, more lawyers, but lawyers are going to make a difference. Therapists are going to make a difference. 
The other thing that, that I thought was interesting, talking about evidence-based, everybody talks about evidence-based. We talked about this. Yes, evidence-based. We do want evidence-based practices. We do want best practices, but we do want practices that have been shown that work with our population, and most of them have not. We did mention some of the practices that, in fact, have been recognized, have been researched, have been evidenced to work in populations like the Puerto Rican or with the Puerto Rican population. So this was uh, an interesting study because it also united themes and issues of the other two. The last presentation was Dr. Rafael Torruella, who really kind of, uh, I think, created a stir in one of the um, audience members because he spoke about his thesis, which was the relocation of drug users from Puerto Rico to U.S., explaining a study that he did, an ethnographic study of 13 drug users who different mayors <laughs> will happily put on a plane, give a ticket, and send to New York. Years ago, there was a piece that, that it was the other way around, that New York was sending to Puerto Rico homeless persons. His experience, his research with case study, ethnographic, really uh, noted how these drug users were relocated to the United States. But the relocation was supposed to be for treatment, and what he found out, the narratives of the experience of these persons, uh, what he found out, they were relocated to houses that were dirty, he, they were relocated to houses where they had to give up their identity. They had to give to the director their identity card, their birth certificate, everything. They had to then sign up, I mean a real scam, you know, then they had to sign up for all the benefits which they gave the house. And this was like amazing, must have been, you know, a horrific uh, experience for him to see how this was a real setup to drain people's money. It really wasn't treatment at all. It wasn't real treatment. It's very sad. But he also spoke about the need to develop, and for Puerto Rico and in the United States, and this was the case in New York, but they've been relocated in other places, not in New York, really a set of guidelines, policies, protective methods for drug using population. The substance abuse pro problem in among Puerto Rican youth has not abated. Since the 1950s, it's been the one constant problem among the Puerto Rican community, particularly for male, but increasingly for female. As alcohol abuse has been for the Native American drug abuse, many of our communities have been decimated in Puerto Rico and New York. And it so happens, even though thousands and thousands of federal dollars have gone to treating this population. He made some recommendations. One very interesting one is to, uh, two interesting recommendations was to really revisit, revision, and change the language. The language that talks about getting clean. Because if you get clean, that means you're dirty. And that's not a, a good concept in our culture to be dirty, okay? And when you're clean, that's, you know, you're not using drugs. So he talks about that has to be changed. That has to be rephrased from active use to non-active use. And I think that's a very powerful recommendation. And it takes away that moralistic edge of, of being clean or being dirty. And another very interesting recommendation was um, develop uh, among drug users, some sort of union, union-like support systems that can provide the drug users protection, support, and a means of managing different aspects of their own treatment, in essence, empowerment, okay? When you look at these different presentations, we really are talking about empowerment. We really are talking about refocusing. We are talking 
a little bit about a series of things that I want to kind of summarize. You know, from this morning, and then with our studies, and then with the data on the criminal justice system, and all our youth incarcerated, they're in jails, they're in drugs, you know, women frustrated without work, high diabetes, you, you know, you, you kind of say, oh my God, you know, don't you feel sometimes it gets like a little dizzy? Like, you know, we're living this, this vertigo, this situation, and says, wait a minute, tremendous poverty rates. I mean, the, the, the slides that Edwin presented just were fascinating, but, you know, very depressing, because depressing, I don't want, yeah, it breaks my heart, but you know what it does, especially on a day like today, it really musters my sense of resistance, you know? What is happening in in our Puerto Rican community, aquí y en Puerto Rico, that we hear all these numbers that are so distressing. So I ask a couple of questions. What is happening to the community that is not in those percentages? Let's look at those two. This point, you know, great. 35% of this, 45% is, okay, but 35 means that there's another percentage. What is that looking like? So 30% didn't graduate, but 70% did, okay? What I'm saying to you is from a then recuperating, we have a lot of recuperating, but our own mental health, we also have to recuperate the language and how we're being talked about so that we really critically examine what we're saying, right? So in a sense, to develop that critical consciousness about what is happening to our own community, because you hear all this distress, and all, it's there. We're not denying it. We're not denials, you know? But let's refocus. What does it mean on this end? What do we have to do? And how about the people who are on this other end? That's one, so it's reframing, okay? And what that means for, for policies. The other comment, and the reason I say this because uh, recently I was looking at some data on, on adolescent depression to kind of make a, a, a statement about discrimination, ethnic identity, and found a lot of interesting things. So Puerto Rican adolescents gets lumped up with other ethnic groups, and then suddenly there's everybody saying, no, Latino adolescents have, have de high depression rates. I was sharing this with Burros, who found the same thing. I didn't know he had found that. And I said, yeah, they're saying that all Latino adolescents, there's a higher prevalence of depression among Latino adolescents. So if you're Puerto Rican, you're part of Latino. But then, you know, when we looked at the studies, when I looked at all those studies, there were only a few that had a Puerto Rican sample. And then of those few that had a Puerto Rican sample, there were some that the sample was so small that it could not reach any power, it could not be significant, okay? So we have to be careful when you read some things and take them on. High soil size rates among Latino, which group? All groups? There's a lot of Latino groups. It turns out that the depression, by the way, that is high in these studies, unfortunately, is the Mexican. The Mexican-American adolescent. And is sometimes the Cuban. None of these studies really had sufficient or powerful evidence that the Puerto Rican adolescent had depression. Now that's not the case in Puerto Rico. But let's get our stats correct. Let's get our percentage. We don't need to add more to the picture, all right? That's another advice. And recently, Garcia Cole said, you know, everybody is looking at all these bad statistics about Puerto Rican, and they depress all our youth. But she did the opposite. She looked at what I'm saying. She looked at the normative. She says, what does normative Puerto Rican development look like? There's a bunch of Puerto Ricans that make it well. Then they make it well, and they come back, and they fight, and they develop. Let's look at them. What were their coping skills? What were their families? What happened? You know, we keep looking at all the bad. Now that, please, I'm a clinician, but I'm a community clinician. So I look at both. I just don't look at, quote, pathology, and I'm also a social critic, okay? But we have to start looking at what is normal 
informative, adolescent Puerto Rican behavior. There's a lot of good stuff happening. Two important issues. Those adolescents that were on, had a high sense of self, of ethnic pride, regardless if they spoke Spanish or English, had better mental health. Of course, because it protects you from discrimination, from bullying. It is a protective coping. So if you have a good sense of pride, of who you are, you're a Boricua, or however you want to call yourself, that is protective. That tells us some things about policy for education, for youth groups. We have to help develop ethnic pride in our youth, ethnic Puerto Rican pride. That's not an issue of being here or there. That's another issue. But that's an issue of being here and trying to deal with discrimination, racism. But it's a very strong protective factor. The last two comments, and then I'm almost, I got it, okay. We need to focus on empowerment strategies. I'm absolutely big. You know, we have all this negative picture, but then let's focus on what we're going to do. You know, what are going to be our positive strategies? We want to focus on empowerment. We want to focus on positive youth development. You know, what do youth need to be strengthened in their identity, to be efficacious, you know, to develop and be lawyers and teachers and help make change, all right? And the last, this is the last comment. And it's a very one dear to my heart and the reason I came back to the United States to work at El Centro. I firmly have, I have been conceptualizing for the past few years as a clinician and as a community activist that the reason we can maybe explain, because all the questions, why Puerto Rico has why this, why that, you know, and it's just, you know, it's not easy to answer all those questions. But from somewhat psychoanalytic perspective, historical, critical psychoanalytic perspective, we cannot forget that Puerto Ricans have had a long chronic history of colonialism, okay? Neither in Puerto Rico or here have we been really examining to what degree we have internalized that other. It has been very destructive for the Native American community who has been looking at that experience of having lost homeland. I think that we need to start looking at the chronic trauma that Puerto Ricans have experienced of being here, being there, am I this, am I New York Rican, am I American Rican, am I Puerto Rican, am I Boricua? What is home? Where's home? Is home here? Is home New York? Is home Chicago? You know, I'm here, but I want to be there. I'm there, but I want to be here. I feel a sense of loss. What comes out in the two studies? Loss. Sense of loss. Sense of not knowing. What is loss? You know, where is home? It's a cultural homelessness. And I really do believe that we need to look at that loss, that trauma of that loss, what it has done, we have looked at it in music. We have looked at it in painting. Where in music? Todos los boleros. So, todos los boleros son de pérdida, you know? But we need to look at it psychologically, sociologically, and see how what we need to do to regain our sense of collective self. That's where I'm ending. Thank you. Economic uh, Opportunity Panel, Dr. Hector Cordero Guzman, Dr. Ismael Garcia Colon, Mimi and Bram Dr. Mimi Abramovitz from the Hunter College School of Social Work, and Dr. Ramon Borges. Um, you know, I think it's safe to say that given our conversations this morning and what we continue to hear on the streets from our family and friends, that while we're continuing to be told that we are in a period of recovery from this great recession of 2008, 
that maybe Larry Summers had it right last January when he said at a White House press conference that it's likely the United States is experiencing more of a statistical recovery, but a human recession. Mm. You know, I guess you could say it seems almost contradictory to speak of economic opportunity when really what we hear is more stories of economic survival, even economic sustainability today. I need not point out, but I will, that the November jobs report released exactly a week ago today indicates that the unemployment rate in the United States now stands at 9.8 percent. We know that at its broadest measure, the actual rate of unemployment may actually be closer to 17.5 percent. We also know that unemployment is strikingly, is strikingly high amongst minorities, with Hispanics reporting a 13.3% unemployment rate, adult men also having a high rate, and our youth, who even though they were one of the only groups of workers to report a decline this past month, I should note of a half a percent from its high of all year, um, many policymakers and labor market economists are murmuring that the decline is likely due to the fact that our youth are either returning to school, remaining in school, or like many of their adult worker counterparts, simply exiting the, the labor market. Over the past year, we know that 44 percent, 44 percent, that's almost one in every two American families, has experienced a job loss or a period of prolonged unemployment. For those employed, the realities are not that much better. We know that 20% of all Americans, actually I should say at least 20% of all Americans are underemployed, meaning that they are overqualified for the job in which they hold, or they are underpaid for which their underpaid wages for which their qualifications would otherwise demand. We also know that workers who are employed are continuing to report experiencing a reduction in hours, declining wages, and the loss of health benefits. Employers themselves continue to note that they remain reluctant to commit to full-time or permanent hires, expanding our temporary workforce, citing uncertainties about tax increases, health care costs, and new regulations stemming from the policy options and discussions that we hear coming out of Washington. Moreover, perhaps an entire generation of wealth creation is at risk of disappearing. And the most important source of wealth and often the, most str the strongest economic safety net for many American families continues to decline in value as the effects of the housing market crash continue to be costly and devastating, especially to our minority homeowners. Foreclosure rates have increased 25% over the past year for Hispanic homeowners. We know that almost 10% of all mortgages nationwide are delinquent, meaning they are more 30 days or more late in payment. And we expect upon this number, given the people I've talked to who've looked at this, the number of individuals having trouble making rent, this includes a lot of our Puerto Rican community in New York City, is likely to be twice as high, so at least 20%. Nearly one in four homeowners are underwater in their mortgages, meaning that they own more on their house than what it is currently worth. And with over 600,000 new mortgages resetting in the next two years, this is also known as arms coming due, we expect that the average mortgage payment on these properties will increase an average of $1,000 a month. While we do not know the exact percentage, a substantial amount of these homeowners are minorities, Hispanics, African Americans, Native Americans, and they are expected to be hit much harder. So, as Edwin Melendez's presentation pointed out today, if these are the reality for all Americans, it is probably only heartbreaking and striking to understand what the reality is for Puerto Ricans. So this is the context in which our speakers had to approach their subjects. How exactly do you talk about economic opportunity at an age like this? And I think that while a lot of their studies are still ongoing and their papers will speak more, um, their general consensus is that just because we are in this type of tight economy does not mean that we cannot seek to understand the mechanisms for understanding, creating, and developing pathways for economic opportunity for our communities and identifying prom prom promising initiatives and areas for policy intervention. So to the question of what do we do, Dr. Mimi Abramovitz, who warmly joked that she wasn't quite sure how her paper fit into the economic opportunity panel, discusses upon a very essential debate in the economic development literature, people versus place. Discussing the issues that an individual's experience of stress and access to opportunity, including jobs and home ownership, may be affected by the neighborhoods in which they live in and the access to the services that they provide, 
brings economic development uh, experts and policymakers to ask the question again, do we invest in the place, do we invest in infrastructure, or do we invest in people? The quintessential human capital versus structural debate, and to which she answers, both. Uh, advancing an interesting technique, which although many people had some comments on, uh, she suggests that the use of GIS technologies can help us understand the relationships between neighborhood conditions, the stress an individual feels, and how they fare in life. I encourage you all to speak with her if you have the chance um, to understand her paper in a bit more detail. To the question of what do we do, Dr. Hector Cordero Guzman offered that small business, a very keystone policy of the Obama administration right now to drive economic growth and employment, uh, maybe effective pathways for economic opportunity. Citing that Puerto Rican businesses in New York are amongst some of the highest, uh, or largest firm sizes, employing the most, employing the most employees. That makes sense. And having high receipt sizes, he says that it is also a chance for economic opportunity. Entrepreneurship is also high in the Hispanic and Latinos noting that the average Hispanic Latino who did not work for themselves, meaning they were employed, we call them wage workers, earned $19,354 in 2000, while the average self-employed Hispanic worker earned 25658 There's also some very interesting um, differentiations across gender lines. However, and perhaps a little sobering, uh, he notes that Puerto Ricans have the lowest rate of self-employment among Hispanic and Latino subgroups with less than 6%. Um, he cites the need for education, noting that a lot of times non-Hispanic um, non-Hispanic groups with higher levels of education are more likely to be self-employed or more likely to own their own firm. I would also add to this that there's also a need for financial literacy, suggesting how do you understand credit in an economy like this. It would also be interesting, as a point was brought up within the panel, to understand the capital firm structures of Puerto Rican firms. There's some literature I've written on this, I know a couple of people have written on this, about the capital choices of Hispanic uh, business owners, where they get their money for startup, how they expand, and how how they grow, and it would be interesting to know how Puerto Rican firms specifically differ from Hispanic firms. The, the uh, difficulty in that, of course, is always the elusive Puerto Rican indicator that Edie's touched upon. It would also be interesting to know about issues of asset development and ownership amongst the Puerto Rican community, as we do know that entrepreneurs do often borrow against their homes or any type of other property, including boats um, or other businesses that they own. To the question of what do we do, Dr. Ramon Bohr has highlighted the importance of understanding growing industries in our economy. With the buzz about green jobs, it's no interest that science, te technology, engineering, and math sectors are growing. However, he cites that um, as, a, as a previous agenda in the Center on Low Wage Workers noted, that basically Puerto Ricans are overwhelmingly concentrated in low wage jobs both within this sector and other sectors or experience persistent level of poverty. What's interesting is looking across educational disaggregation on these variables, he notes that uh, Puerto Ricans are more likely to have associate degrees in this field versus bachelor's or master's, citing a need to improve our educational pipeline, speaking to another panel that talked today. But he also notes that it takes them longer to finish an associate's degree in this field, three, three and a half years compared to what we understand the degree to be as two. Um, Finally, Dr. Ismael Garcia Colon provides an insight into a migrant Puerto Rican farm workers in the Northeast through a survey funded by Centro and also with uh, the support of the Ford Foundation. And what's unique about this is it provides a look into a portrait of the migrant worker community that when we think about low-wage farm work in the United States, overwhelmingly, we think of Mexican migrants coming in. Growing up in California, that's definitely how I understood uh, Margaret Feinle. But what's interesting is that, and I encourage you to speak to him on the specifics, the, uh, what do you call it? the preliminary data suggests that actually this particular cohort exhibits characteristics, higher levels of education, um, a higher age group in general, and perhaps higher wages than what we know most migrant workers to do. Um, 
this is an ongoing work and I'm sure that as it progresses it will also give us some key insights into not only questions about economic opportunity for this group, migratory flows to and from Puerto Rico as they pertain to this group, and also provide us a key area of understanding into these unique sectors where Puerto Rican low wage workers are concentrated but we often don't, think, well not aren't concentrated but are present and we often don't think about they may be. This also brings us up to a point that kind of underscores this low wage labor work that we've done previously in which we find that most low wage Puerto Ricans are not in the agricultural industry as most Hispanic low wage workers are but rather in other industrial sectors. And that brings me to basically four kind of key areas of further research that I think the Centro could potentially underscore or we are already doing. Um, the first goes to speak to uh, Dr. Ismael, Dr. Garcia Colon's point about understanding certain niches in the labor market and also to Dr. Borges' point about we have to understand where Puerto Ricans stand in certain sectors, what occupations they have. We need to know the pathways at the bottom to the middle and the pathways from the middle to the top and what's going on at the top as well. It's important to understand these pathways. It's important to understand the institutions and the social networks which exist for other populations and how we can replicate them within our Puerto Rican communities. Second is, of course, the important point that we've heard over and over from the Educational Policy Initiative, and that is we need to strengthen the educational pipeline. There is no reason for this vast educational disparity to exist within the Puerto Rican community. But there are structural factors which make it so, and there are places and areas of intervention that are desperately needed. And I applaud the work done by our current educational team. This includes Dr. Luis Reyes and a couple of our data assistants to try to close this gap, as well as the many organizations that you pointed out to as well. The f third area is definitely the question of assets. We need to understand how assets are created within the Puerto Rican community, our holdings and our building of them. We know that with the value of homes dropping, this may not be the primary asset for the American, human, uh, for the American family in the next decade or two. And finally, and maybe perhaps most importantly, there is a need to understand how social networks influence our economic safety nets and our social safety nets. This is a tough economic time and it's a tough economic era, but there's definitely ways to answer these questions and there's definitely areas of research that are needed. And so I look forward to being part of Central as we approach these issues and I welcome anybody interested in joining us on these topics. Thank you. I think our panel deserves another round of applause. I think we have a few minutes. I, I think we've generated a lot of interest, and I obviously think we should have at least a few uh, questions uh, to the panel about uh, or uh, comments, um, and then we will probably segue into some closing remarks and next steps. Uh, so, are there questions at this point? Have you thought of replicating this program in Puerto Rico? Have we thought of replicating this program in Puerto Rico? That's a, that's a question for our director here of the Centro, Edwin Melendez. Well, uh, uh, it's truly a challenge. Uh, you know, we barely can tackle the reality of Puerto Ricans in, in the mainland or in the United States. And uh, uh, I don't know how to put it, but Puerto Ricans do have a big mess down there. And, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> It's a, it's a very challenging problem. Uh, I mean, I have a couple of initiatives that are just taking us around to have more of a dialogue with the uh, island uh, researchers, but my primary goal there is really to promote the understanding of Puerto Ricans in the U.S. in the island and try to jump over some of the prejudice and barriers that, that we face when we come back, we'll go back. And, uh, and so that's a narrow goal. Uh, so I'm not quite sure that's the answer uh, you like to hear, but it's, it's, it's not that we haven't thought about the connection. Let, let me also put this in perspective. Um, when Edwin asked me to, to embark on this project, one of the things that became immediately evident is that Puerto Ricans have fallen off the face of the research agenda, pretty much. 
pretty much. Uh, for us to get information on any one of these different areas, we have jumped hoops, have gone through so much to try to find information about Puerto Ricans because what is if there's research that is being generated now, it's on Hispanics, Latinos, and so to find anything disaggregated has just been a monumental task. Uh, just around what, just around these these particular areas, which are key areas, right? Economic opportunity, uh, criminal justice, health, um, um, education. I mean, we're, we're not talking about obscure, you know, areas of research. We're talking about things that really are affecting our community. And one of the major issues that that that's come out of this conference is that in every area, we're talking about a community that is in, in severe crisis. But um, it's it's with it's hardly known because it, it, the inability to, to have that, that data readily available. So this is really a, a remarkable initiative and, and just to, to the extent that, that it is a concerted effort to make this, this research available. And you know, it's really a tribute to the people who participated in with, with very little resources. We, we tried to uh, provide some, some resources and funding, but we, we, we certainly um, uh, you know, thank the people who participated in this who really made a, a real effort to try to get this data for us today. I just want to say that we're really interested in looking at the connection that we have on Puerto Rico and the renewal of the community here and as it relates to Puerto Rico. And the paper by Rafi is one big example. Uh, the work that is management with farm workers. Uh, Anna and I did a paper on migration selectivity and what's happening with the, with the flow. So it's, and, you know, Maria Chaltegui is doing a paper on workforce development in Puerto Rico. So we have a little portfolio that emphasizes that connection. And programmatic, we want to do more about they knowing more about us. As a, kind of, as a precondition for overcoming prejudice. But that's, it's very limited. It's not, you know. Just, just follow up question. Is it because of lack of resource, financial resource, lack of data, or is there a sense of priority philosophically? Well, uh, where do you want to do your program? Well, the mission is uh, the center has been for you know 40 years, uh, pretty much by the political community of the United States. However, uh, many of us, you know, kind of, you know, still around, and we we have an active uh, research program that also combines with Puerto Rico. But so there are many reasons why. But the most uh, telling one is that we, I mean, we have such a big challenge in understanding ourselves in the United States that sometimes if we dilute the resources, it will be a diversion to that core mission. But it's, it's uh, you know, we hope we can do more with that. And, you know, the PRSA conference a couple of years ago was there. We had a good dialogue. So it's a uh, it's, it's work in progress. But it's certainly not a programmatic, uh, uh, you know, huge investment from our part. I don't want to mislead anyone on that. I would be a little bit provocative in suggesting that after looking at this issue of the relationship between the stateside Puerto Rican community and Puerto Rico and having worked down there, I worked most of my professional life here, I'm beginning to question the, that reality that we are one community at this point in our history. We are facing a community that is second, third, even fourth generation stateside born who has some memory of Puerto Rico, but is essentially English speaking. Uh, the issues that are confronting Puerto Rico today are so vast, so distinctly unique to the island as contrasted to our issues that I have no quarrel with doing programs that have mutual interest. But should that be the central concern? A more provocative question would be, to my mind, <coughs> would be our relationship with the other Latinos in the United States. You pointed out that there's a dearth of specific research data on Puerto Ricans. Well, that's all been subsumed under the Latino. And that's happened in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. What will be our posture as a community, as a center, whose primary concern is Puerto Rican issues? How do we deal with that new reality? That is a central reality. How do we differentiate ourselves do we have a different strategy? Obviously, you could say we can work together. But do we have a distinct posture vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other Latino groups in this country? 
who are much larger than ours. Mm -hmm. So those are questions as we look forward, how do we, we cannot continue to look on the status of the Puerto Rican community as it was 40 years ago, which is a tendency that we all have. I think we have to look at these new realities and develop a new comprehensive policy strategy based on the realities of the, this new century. I was wondering if uh, louder so that everyone can hear. I'm, I'm wondering if there's um, anyone looking at the connections between some of these areas that we have represented in the panel, for instance, me health, mental health, special education, where a great number of our students are represented, and the criminal justice system. But my, my feeling is that we're producing through the education system mm -hmm. these problems, mm -hmm. some of the problems yeah. in the criminal justice system, and some of the speakers to address that issue. And nobody's bringing that up. I think that's really critical. Uh, I think I think you're, you're right. There, in many ways, the failure of the mental health system to um, adequately address the needs of, of Latino Puerto Rican youth in general is contributing to all those issues. Also, the failure of mental health and provincial services behind the wall in prison is significant because individuals are being released with very little care while they're inside and then uh, released into the general population. I also know that there is clearly a connection between um, the research that Hector Cordero's was talking about in your panel that you mentioned about small businesses in Puerto Ricans and that the rate is so low for Puerto Rican small business ownership because effectively, at least with respect to employment, um, the most flexibility of employing people with criminal histories is in small businesses. It's where you can control who you employ and you can actually stake out your own business and decide all kinds of factors. When it comes to government employment and employment in large corporations, a criminal history background will knock you out of the heartbeat. But small business generation is critical to try and create an employment uh, a source for people with criminal histories. Let me also mention that for those of you that weren't in the criminal justice panel, uh, there was a whole section about social conditions, education, health, and so on, that, that are really affecting uh, the, 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 the vulnerability and making Puerto Rican communities particularly vulnerable to cr crime strategies, police strategies, like stops and frisks and, and, and so on. That, those are the communities that, that are being targeted. So poor and poor Latino, African American communities are really the target of these, these types of, of strategies and we're extremely vulnerable. Uh, there's also data about connecting how unhealthy communities for boys of color, right, including Latinos, um, is it, creating conditions where they're more likely or not to have uh, negative consequences in terms of criminal justice. Um, so if you if you are raising young people in unhealthy communities, and I mean that in the in the, the broader sense, um, in terms of poverty, in terms of lack of uh, educational opportunities, health care, etc., that you are more likely to have a generation that is feeding into this pipeline to prison. That's interestingly the name of a project um, done by research done by the New York Civil Liberties Union on the criminalization um, of youth in public schools. So the issue that um, Juan Cartagena mentioned has been researched and documented and discussed um, and the concern about um, that and, and the impact, the long-term impact on youth of color in particular. So I think it, it needs to be, it needs greater attention, that kind of continuum that you're talking about. I also think in terms of the data that the Community Service Society has produced on this um, young adult population age 16 to 24 and disconnection, that the issue of educational counseling is strongly implicated so that if youth decide or feel pushed out of public, public schools, that there is some counseling about next steps. And for that matter, if they're leaving college, moving into college, always that next step counseling, um, which is a really crucial piece, and I'm not sure who's looking at that. Um, I have a question for Mr. Consanada, but anyone in the panel feel free to answer. Uh, the relationship to the diversifying the living profession and the criminal justice system. Do you feel that by diversifying the living profession, we can help put a stop to mass incarceration? And effective policy making that responsive to the community that we're trying to integrate. 
Um, so, um, I, I am clearly of the belief that larger numbers of Puerto Ricans within the law enforcement slash uh, legal profession will have, will have a positive effect on stemming some of the worst abuses of the margins uh, for Latino communities and Puerto Rican communities in the United States. I mean, the kind of outrageous behavior that occurs, occurs at the margins will be stemmed. It is, but there is, a, there is a leap of faith here, and that is that the Puerto Rican cop will not be blue, but be brown. That the Puerto Rican DA will give a break to the to a person who needs a break. But the Puerto Rican judge, in the wonderful words of Sonia, will be a wise Latina. And the Puerto Rican lawyer will make sure that she is also responding to the broader needs of the community. But, bro, if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. There is some research that, that shows that if uh, among um, attorneys of color, they're more likely than not to be uh, predisposed to assist their, their communities and to be serving their communities. The, the lack of availability of a pool, a significant pool, means that those are, those are resources that are not there. Uh, with regard to other aspects of, of the, the criminal justice system, such as law enforcement, low-level police officers are more likely to fall into to the regular culture that exists already. They are not in a position to be changing. Remember, the police uh, department itself is, is a, a hierarchical, almost paramilitary in that sense. So they are taking orders. They're not in a position to give orders. So what, what is going to be needed is people at the higher level, policy-making level. Uh, in terms of some judges, there's some, some uh, research that shows Latino judges tend to be fairer, actually, than white judges. So there's been some, some literature, not, not enough research done, but certainly some, some indication that that is true. That, that Latino judges would be much much more fair.